Well, 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 true colors, never a truer word has been spoken. Welcome, new hire, no, not the new hire class, it's the new agent class of 23.001. We are in day six, no, day seven, no, it's Wednesday, it's day eight. You are almost there to the point where you're going to start making a lot of money. How is everybody doing this morning? Doing good. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Good morning, Sam. Okay. Good morning. Yo. Good morning, Samuel. I love it. Yes. True colors. I will be there for you because you know what I've learned is when I do this particular day, people are just like, wow, yep, it's just too much. But that's okay. We're going to get through it together. Let's start with who watched a sale yesterday? Who actually, why, electronic hands, if you would, who actually saw a sale yesterday? Let's go with uh, Joanne. You saw a sale. Walk us through it, Joanne. What market? Who was the person that presented and what happened? I watched um, the veteran market yesterday with Troy. Troy Plummer. Okay. Troy Plummer. I watched two of them. Um, there was a sale in both of them. They were both single gentlemen. Mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Um, one of that, the second one was pretty cool because he was like, he had like, um, he was like the head of like this vet, um, organization of some sort where he had like all these people that he can connect Troy to. Um, yeah. but all in all, um, let's see what stuck out. Um, I don't know. They are both fairly simple. Nobody really like, <laughs> nobody really like gave him a hard time yesterday. That's awesome, right? Kind of just like ran perfect. through and then he got to the benefits. He stuck with the, I think it was like 120 a month or some of some sort. Uh -huh. and, and, and they went through with that and it was like easy for both. The He's... second guy loved him so much. He just would not stop talking. Troy had to get him off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is absolutely awesome. Yeah. So the so two sales, what were what was the amount? Do you remember the ALP? I think the ALP was around 1200 he said. Okay. So it's just below gold. Somewhere around there. Oh. Yeah. So 1200 and did he sell the A71 product with that? Yes. Nice. Okay. I'm yeah, loving it. That's great. Mm, let's see. Lucas, what about you? You saw a tell yesterday? Yes, sir. I, I was in the same one with uh, with Troy. Uh, okay. That doesn't count. I mean, it does count yeah. for the DRB, but I want to yeah, get yeah. something else. Anybody else see a sale that wasn't Troy Plummer yesterday? Mary Frederick. Mary, quite contrary. Sorry about that. No, I watched <laughs> Troy Plummer. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of people did, right? So that's good. I'm glad that everyone watched it. So let me ask you this, Mary. How closely did he stick to the script? He stuck pretty well to the script. I mean, except for, you know, the personal back and forth conversations. But other than that, he stuck to the script pretty well. Okay. Oh, that's good. I like that. What about you, uh, Samuel? Did you see somebody other than Troy? Yeah, I was actually on one with Eddie yesterday. Eddie Leon, our um, guy who probably saw the car. Yeah. Probably okay, worked. walk me through. I saw which actually fit in with yesterday's class quite well, because the guy had 20 medications. <laughs> so it took a while to get through all those and, and figure out what he's actually getting so how old was he um i think he was uh over 60 74 okay 74 oh, took a lot of medications and did eddie submit him as a trial or standard uh to be honest i don't remember how he submitted him but it seemed like i'm hoping it was a trial with as many medications as he was on well so. i don't understand he would have told the client if he was submitting him as a trial right i think I think the way they did it is he's probably submitted a standard because um, they were going to go through with the payment. So, okay. So then, yeah, he submitted them as a uh, as a standard. So that's good. 
So awesome. So Eddie, did he have any objections that he had to overcome? Um, a couple here and there. Uh, he just wanted to make sure that he he has one son that he doesn't really like and then another son that he did like. So he was just kind of really focusing on making sure that it was for the son that he liked. So so really, there were no objections is what you're telling me. He was buying. Too much. He, he actually really wanted the insurance and he was a really great guy. So. Oh, that's fortunate, right? Everybody's doing it. Who watched a uh, presentation where there was not a sale? Somebody, anybody? Kelly McDaniel, is that you? Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, I actually watched the same ones that everybody else is talking about, but I saw one with Sam. Uh, let's see, what was his name? Sam M, I forget what his whole last name was, but uh, he was setting the guy up, then he got to all the questions. The guy had lung cancer. Okay. And went through all the medications and everything with him, and then he muted himself. And he, he just kept saying he felt so bad, so bad that it was like he was kind of trying to pull himself together to get back on the phone with him to tell him that he wasn't eligible. But at the same time, the guy gave him all kinds of referrals. Okay. And he spoke to the brother and because the brother was there throughout and told him, yeah, can you please put him back on? And he said, I'm going to get back with you because his brother was interested. But he was more focused on figuring out how to tell this guy he couldn't help him. I mean, you could tell that Sam was truly upset. All right. So let me ask you this. So in the process, uh, when they asked those four questions, is that when he discovered, right, at the needs yes. analysis? Is that when he yes. discovered he had lung cancer? Yes. So how much time elapsed from the time that he discovered that guy had lung cancer to the time he got him off the phone? Oh, not that Probably. long. Okay, so Maybe. he moved fairly quickly, right? Yes, he just took a minute to pull himself together for getting on the phone to tell him. But then okay. he also came back and said he was going to do his best to find a way to help him. He kept saying his brother's the underwriter going to get it back there, and he was going to do his best to try to get something done for him. Huh. Okay. Oh, he well, said that like three times. My brother's the underwriter. Right. Okay. And May, so. Yeah. Interesting. Well, at least you saw somebody who had to uh, come up with, hopefully, you know, rationale for why we can't. Did he tell him that he would be declined? Did he tell him he didn't qualify? How did he let him know? That at the time, he couldn't get him qualified. At right today or well it was yesterday but today uh -huh. he couldn't get him qualified didn't say that he was automatically declined he said it basically in a nice way because this guy had get, already given him his checkbook number routing number all these references and everything and then he wasn't able to move forward after asking all those questions Okay. Well, it happens. Dora Stokes, did you watch a presentation that didn't result in a sale yesterday? Uh, yes. God. Day eight. Day um, eight. No, it confused me because it said you're muted. Never mind. But yes, I did. He got to the needs analysis. But when he asked about the cancer, he kind of like didn't say it. Like he just said, it almost sounded like he just said terminal illness. And the client was like, no, not a terminal illness. Then he presented. And at the end, he was like, I, when he like said yes to the plan, he said he has cancer and he's getting it removed. Oh, uh, okay. A uh, quick aside, I guess on the DRB link, I said it's working that, though. Yeah, but I didn't use the word submit, right? I just used form because it's what I can see as opposed to what you guys can see. So you got it now. So everyone can go ahead and do that. All right. So you saw somebody who didn't do it as well. Gotcha. Did they try to overcome any objections or <laughs> anything yeah, like that? Yeah, the client was really tough. Like even throughout it, like he was like, well, the benefits you're giving me before he got to like the permanent, he was like, this isn't worth it. Like, well, we're not getting anything. You know, he was kind of disappointed for what the VA was offering, like the $300 burial, things like that. Right. Um, well, the whole point we do that so we can demonstrate that they're not going to get that much and they think they're getting more, right? And that's right. what we, okay. 
the agent did a really good job though. He sounded so confident and like just kept going back to the script and it worked Uh-oh. so well. So yeah, it was great. Agent? Who was the agent? I can't remember. He's under Ashley though. Ashley Rust? Okay. Torian. It was Torian. Torian. Torian Fields? Yes. Okay. He was so great. Torian Fields. Is there anything that you saw Torian do that you don't think you could do? Nope. Yeah, see? It's not that difficult. Mohammed, what do you got for me? Uh, I actually watched two presentations that both resulted in no sale, uh, one by Will and the other by Henry. Okay. Uh, the one with Will, he got through everything. He And then once he got to the needs analysis, the guy on the other side was just very stubborn. And it was like, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. It got to the point where Will just completely just stopped the needs analysis and just finished. Like he asked them, are you sure you don't want the needs analysis? You know, the, the tech speak and the script. And then he ended it. He ended it there with the report form. Yeah. Uh, as with that's... Henry. Yeah. God. Go ahead. Okay. As with Henry, um, uh, he got all the way through to the, I forget how far he, I think he got the benefit summary up and the guy on the other side just started getting very aggravated. He was, he was nice. The guy was nice up until that point. He got very aggravated and said, we'll do this later. We'll do this later. And then he just hung up, hung up yeah. the phone on the zoom. So and uh, in that yeah. particular presentation, when the agent first started, did he say, Hey, is this still a good time for us to meet? Well, he just got out of the hospital two hours prior. So oh, not a good time to me. Not a good time. Yeah. So you as agents, when you become aware of something like that, you need, in my opinion, you should offer the client the opportunity to reschedule. As much as you want to close them, think about what's going on. They're still going to have the same level of urgency by being in the hospital tomorrow. Does that make sense? Just think about if you were getting a tooth pulled or out of the hospital, do you really want to talk about spending money at that point, you will wait most likely until tomorrow. And if you want to sell the A71 value, it still goes up. What do we do if the client hangs up before the report card? You just say no interest by the client on the HP Pro. Uh, That's for uh, closing out the presentation. On the report card, Did if they you should have gotten the uh, email address, right? So you would still fill it out. Just fill it out as if you did a great job. He also still got really good referrals off that as well. I think he got like six or seven. What I typically tell people is quite frankly, you want to get paid. Okay. There's no doubt about it. However, the number one goal in a presentation is to get the next presentation, in my opinion, because we know you're going to close at least for all of you between 20 and 30%. So that's a given that's going to happen if you just follow the script. So in my mind, what becomes more valuable for all of you is getting the <clears throat> plus leads are the referrals because 50% of those people show up and of those 50% or more buy. So in your mind, the more referrals you're getting, the more money you're going to be socking away. Okay. So I would never, I never got discouraged when somebody either said, nope, don't want it. They closed out the zoom or whatever. I never got discouraged with that because I was generating rev, uh, referrals or plus leads or sponsorships. Okay. All right, so everyone is able to fill out the DRB, so that's good. Thank you, whoever put the correct link up there. I appreciate that. Uh, Devin Gold, what's happening, man? Did you watch a presentation yesterday? Yes, sir. I watched the one with Torian on it, and then right after that, uh, we got to watch Ashley present. Did Ashley close? She did. Yeah, of course she did. It was was tough, honestly. the husband and wife, they wanted the policy. Well, let's just say they were into the policy. They were into the benefits, but the husband had just signed up for health insurance. So right when he heard that he has to pay for another policy, um, he pretty much started getting aggravated. <laughs> and then it was rebuttal after rebuttal after rebuttal, but Ashley pretty much countered everything they had. It took mm-hmm. about, I'd say an hour it took maybe two hours, two hours, 30 minutes. Um, okay. but she gave them time. She told, she basically told them to like, all right, if you guys need to mute and talk about it with each <clears> other, <throat> go ahead and do that. And mm-hmm. so she stepped away for five minutes, came back and the wife was like, all right, we're doing it. <laughs> How much ALP was that sale? Um, it was about Daniel help me if I'm incorrect, but I think it was maybe in the 2k range. Yeah, like 2,800. 
Okay, so everyone should know. So I'm I'm Ashley Rutz. Um, so here's the thing, right? She's got somebody on the phone. She's been out of work, not out of work. She, uh, I mean, she may have told you guys that she's moved. She's in the process of moving. She just started to get back into the fold. She's an RGA, which is uh, all the way up here, right? So here's somebody who's been out for a little bit, gets back into it. She gets a client, what you're telling me, she gets a client who's like, yeah, I don't want it. And what does she end up doing? She ends up closing them at a ridiculously high number when they weren't going to spend a dime, right? So there's, uh, I think, a perfect example of somebody who has really good rapport building skills. Is that fair to say? She can definitely build rapport. She knows her stuff. So let me ask you, Devin, in that process, how far did she stray from the script? Uh, she didn't really stray at all. It was pretty script driven. Um, I mean, she would just hit them where it hurts with the rebuttals. Mm -hmm. um, basically tell them, she told them a couple of times, like, all right, you're buying this with your health. Mm -hmm. um, you're not necessarily buying this policy with your money. And uh, once they got to realize that, um, the wife started talking to the husband. You could tell she was like, okay, we really need this. I get we're, you know, spending 200, 300 a month, but this is something we have to have. And it worked. So the wife was the one that was making the decision. Now, it, it, who was the vet? Was it a veteran call? It was a veteran call. The husband. Who was the veteran? I believe. The vet, the, the husband? I believe so. Okay, so that, that this another example of how powerful it is to have both parties there, right? Because right. if you spoke to the husband by himself, he said, oh, my wife's not available, and you went ahead and did the presentation, or sorry, she did the presentation, that never would have resulted in a sale, correct? Agreed, agreed. Yeah. So it's just amazing uh, how powerful it is to get both parties there, and then obviously you've got the report building skills, you stick to the script, you understand how to overcome objections, you can end up with a $2,800 sale. All right, I have 54 submissions on the DRB, but I got 70 people in the class. So help me so I can submit our attendance, please. Okay, I need all those DRBs in. Today, we are going to do what? What are we doing today, Tara? You look like you're completely engaged and you know what's going on. Can you hit the mute button? That's the question. We are going through EAP front to back. Yes, we're doing EAP. All right. I love it. Harpreet, you have a question for me. What can I do for you? Yeah, so I basically am trying to download EAP, like you said yesterday, and um, it's not letting me. When I try to log into that website that they, uh, they're they telling us on the aws.planetaltig, uh, uh, it's oh. saying that I'm not authorized to uh, log in. So, Harpreet, were you in class with us yesterday? Yes. Uh, did you was... remember that I said you would not be authorized if you don't have an agent number yet and you need to get the login and password from your upline? Okay. You what... about that? Okay. Yeah, I, I think I... <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So all you got to do is text your upline and say, hey, I'm trying to download it. I'm not authorized. Can I get your AWS login and password? And but, they should uh, get no do, problem. They get my agent number recently. So do I tell them I got my agent number? And uh, No, because that's so, your agent number, when everything flows through, you will then have access to it. If you're trying to log in with your uh, Planet Altig login and it's not working, that means they haven't given you access to it yet. You're not okay. going to get it today or in five minutes. So just go ahead and text or call your upline and have them provide to you their password login for AWS. Then you can log in, then you can click on that button, and then you can download it, okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Zuri, what's happening? What can I do for you? Hey, yeah, so I tried everything. The I followed the guide. I reached out to my SA, got the login and everything for the download. But instead of getting a pop-up or anything, any kind of prompt, it just kind of disappears. And if I, like, jump into my downloads folder, I have, like, this weird CR download link every time I attempt that. Um, basically, I can't get it to go through. And uh, my what essay- What laptop account, do you have? Uh, it's an Asus ZenBook, but it's a Windows. Yeah, I have that too. Okay. So you're not using Chrome, which is good because Chrome won't let you load any software. Oh, uh, no, I am using Chrome. That's the problem, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I thought you said an Asus. I have an Asus, but it's not a Chrome. It's actually- oh. 
laptop. If you're trying to use a okay. Chrome, Chrome no, no. OS. Okay. I thought you meant like the web browser. <laughs> no, oh, so okay. it's Asus, but I'm using Chrome as my internet. Okay, so that's your problem. Chrome will allow you to load the software on your machine. You need an yeah. actual machine, okay? Any other questions from anybody? Okay, so <clears throat> I suppose we should get started. I'm assuming that all of you were able to download eApp yesterday working with your websites and you're ready to go. You got complete access, correct? Anybody yes. did not have that yesterday? Heather Michaels, I'm Heather. Heather has the camera on. What's the deal, Heather? <laughs> you and camera. I'm you just can't... doing things. I'm eating. I don't want everybody to see me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but so I was able to uh, use my friend Katrina's um, login to oh. download the app. Huh? So should I also use her login information to like... Uh no no okay if you download it we're going to go through it together what i how i want you to log into it okay oh okay because i i was just going to say i don't actually have my state license approval yet it's still that's processing okay. okay that's okay we okay. do not want you so everybody knows okay okay in this class i am very explicitly telling you never use someone else's login to get into eapp all right. There's a reason for that. If you went, in, so let's say uh, I just started and I want to write a policy, but I don't have my license yet, or I don't have my license in the state of uh, Arizona. So I call my upline, like, hey, can you do this policy for me? Like, hey, no problem. Here's my login. Just go ahead and log in and write the policy. If I were to do that, would I be at risk? Joe Jarek. Would I be at risk if I use someone else's login to write a policy? Yes. Yes. Stephanie, would I be at risk? Yes. And I don't have um, eApp yet. Okay. I'm still working it. All right. Okay. All right. So you're working on it. No problem. Does anybody believe they would not be at risk? So... Nico, your hand is up. Are you giving me an answer or you have a question? No, I was one of the people that I didn't, my e-app wasn't downloading properly. Okay, your e-app's not downloaded properly. So we'll look at that after I go through everything and we'll be fine. Nicole Sanders, are you on? There you are. Hey, Nicole. Morning. Just sorry. Hey, morning, Nicole. Everybody knows Nicole uh, is joining the class uh, because uh, graciously joining the class, but she's a senior person, been around for a long time. Nicole, if I were to give you my login to eApp so that you could write a policy in a state that you're not licensed in, would you be at risk? Uh, yeah, I would never do that. Uh, would I be at risk by doing that? By yeah, giving you're you both access? at risk. You're still licensed individually. Exactly. Right. So we, when we talk about getting your login to AWS, that's just reporting. That's just information. You're not actually writing any policies whatsoever until you uh, use eApp. The moment you use eApp, what is the thing, T Dozier, what is the thing that would put me at risk if I were to use someone else's login? Do you know? It's okay if you don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You are signing your name to that document, okay? So I want to get all this out in front as we talk about EAP because this is where everything else that you do is great. That's fine. You make mistakes. You control it. It's okay. When you get into EAP, you need to follow the rules. You need to do exactly what you're taught. You need to make sure that you don't try to cut corners uh, and have somebody else do something for you because when you do that, you're putting both of yourselves at risk. Uh, a few years ago, we had a guy who was using a app extensively and he was writing a lot of policies and he wasn't actually doing it correctly. He was intentionally misleading the client and putting more things in there that he should. The result of that is that he had really, really high ALP and he got paid a lot of money. However, <clears throat> uh, he eventually got caught <clears throat> and not only was he liable potentially for civil uh, infractions, but when you sign your name to EAP, Nicole Sanders, if I make a fraudulent statement on EAP by signing my name to it, what potentially could I also be liable for? Uh, 
to pay the claim if they die? Pay the claim and I am committing what type of crime? Fraud. Fraud. And fraud, is it a misdemeanor or is it a felony? Felony. It is a felony. Oh, somebody else is going to answer. It's a <clears throat> felony. No, it's a felony. Uh, I won't call it anymore, Nicole. You're good now. <clears throat> so it is a felony. So what I'm trying to make sure everyone understands is you got to take this part very, very seriously. If you get bad information from the client and you're filling out the form, the client is signing that as well. And you're saying to the best of my knowledge and ability, based on talking to the client, the information they gave me, everything I put in here, I attest to being accurate and true. Okay. However, if you look at the client, they weigh 700 pounds in the Zoom and you say that they weigh 150 because that's what they told you. Uh, you need to let underwriting know that, hey, I saw something that maybe not uh, align with the information. That's a separate thing. But if you say, uh, someone tells you in the Zoom, hey, I'm a smoker, <laughs> but I uh, don't want to have smoking rates. You're like, oh man, I feel really bad for you. So yeah, I won't say that you're a smoker. Uh, then you are fraudulently putting information on there, correct? Right? So there are things that you need to make sure that you do, which is your signature only goes on applications that you yourself ever, ever write. Okay. Well, I don't want to harp on it too much. I'm just making sure everyone understands there's a difference between everything else that you do and EAP in and of itself. Okay. We don't have any problems with AM International with people doing anything wrong. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. However, there has been stuff in American income over the years where people try to game the system. Eventually, you will get caught. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and we're about to jump into it. Let me look at the comments real quick to make sure I have anything. It's HP Pro, had to leave early because the PDF. The PDF is in Planet Altig under the link uh, download e app. When you click on that little screen with the guy holding the thing there, do I, does anybody need me to show them that or do you all know and have already done it? Does anybody need me to show Planet Altig where you download e app? Yes, please. Can you yes, show? Yes, please. Yeah, absolutely. So let's do this. Let's go to a new window. And let's do this. And let me share my screen right there. Okay. So, all right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, you can. Okay. So, in here, I'm going to type in Planet Altig, right? And when I type in Planet Altig, everyone should have the ability to log in at this level. So, you put your login, then your password. And once you do that, you come up with this screen here, which is where you initially landed. Everyone should go to this page every single day in the morning when they start their job or their day. And I'm going to go through all this information with you probably tomorrow. But you're going to scroll down to this gentleman right here with a phone next to his ear and it says how to download eApp. When you click on that, a PDF file will then pop up. And remember, eApp uh, can only download into a Windows environment and has to be on a computer with a hard disk so that it can actually run software that's installed on it, right? So Chromebook is not an option. We also uh, optimize eApp for Chrome as opposed to Edge or Internet Explorer or anything like that. So you go through the process here to turn off your uh, security, uh, things that can block, you know, malware and viruses and things of that nature. You may not necessarily have to do that. I don't know what the status of your computer is, but if you do this, everything should work. And then once you uh, actually get it turned off, then you're going to go to aws.planetaltig.com and you're going to log in there. And once you can log in, uh, you will then see this. So we're logging into that for you. So I can log in because I'm an actual agent. However, some of you may not have uh, signed contracts in actual agents yet where they've activated this for you. If that's the case, then you just need the login and password of your upline. You'll get to this screen right here. And when you get to this screen in the upper right hand corner, it says eApp download. That's where you download eApp to your computer. Is that good for everybody? Do I have any questions? Uh, yeah, Ronak, what can I do for you? Uh, yeah, so when I downloaded the app uh, after it was ready to go, um, it asked for like the agency and there's like a list of like 30 different names, probably even more. Uh, I was looking for Mark Deshai, it wasn't on there. So I just put AO. That's what we're supposed to all do. Yeah, Mark Deshai isn't his own agency. He is an RGA under uh, AO. So all of us 
regardless of what our uh, RGA ship is, we would all put AO. And Dora Stokes, what can I do for you? Just to make sure, so we're ready. Do you want us to be like on the app where it says start presentation or existing application? Is that where we should be right now? Well, first and foremost, uh, you will be there, but what I want everyone to, who's not there is that this screen should show up once you have it downloaded and once you open it for the first time. Yes. When you actually open it, it should be at this screen before you log in. If you've already logged in, that's completely fine. Okay. It should be at this screen. At this screen, you have transmit applications, update software online, and sale. In order to facilitate a sale, you would click on that button. However, because the software uh, resides on your laptop, uh, American Income has made a commitment to all the states that if there's a change in rate or a change in any of the forms that's required by the states, that the entire agency, the entire American Income workforce will have the updated uh, forms within one week, okay? So that then means is that you need to update your software at least once a week. Now, if you don't update it, that's fine until time runs out. And when time runs out, you won't be able to log in and do a sale until you update the software. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so do I have any questions? No. All right. Uh, so the next one is, or one of the top is transmit applications. If you wanted to just log in and transmit applications, you could do that. And it would automatically upload things into what's called impact. We're going to look at that uh, in a little bit. Second one is the update online. And then the third one is going to be uh, sales. Okay. And I think I have some people that raise their hands. Uh, you know what? I can't see any of you. So I don't know who raised their hand. If your hand is raised, just let me know. Okay. Three people have their hand. My hand is raised. Yeah. Yeah. Both of us. Heather Michaels, go ahead. Heather? Heather Michaels? Okay. Uh, Joe Nava? Yeah, so I went to aws.planetaltig and I put in my login information and it's saying that I'm not authorized to access that site. You know what that's about? <laughs> So are you guys like intentionally trying to mess with me or what? Are you are you messing with me, Joe? Or are you serious? No, I'm serious. Joe, didn't I didn't I just explain to someone else that if you try to log into AWS and it says you're not authorized, that you need to go to your upline and get their login and password so that you can log into that website and then click on the download eApp button? Did I did No, I must I must have missed that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's me. I'm sure it's me. Michael Carlton, what can I do for you? Michael? Uh, I know that uh, the steps is taking me through is Chrome, and I don't have Chrome. And you said we're not using Chrome, so what am I supposed to do? I'm, I'm on something totally different. I mean, that's the only steps it's showing me. It's how to download it through, through okay. Chrome. Hold on. It's optimized for Chrome in the sense of our instructions are to show you how to uh, turn off your uh, security so that you can get the software downloaded. That's all the instructions talk about is for uh, the Chrome browser. You can use any type of browser and try to download it. It's just that if you're unable to because you got a firewall or something blocking it, you have to figure out what the firewall issue is. Does that make sense? Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I'm... <laughs> This is going to sound crazy, but I, I, so I'm guessing, where do I, I don't see anywhere where it says just download it at then. And so am I missing something? I don't see a button where it says just download. You don't see a button that says download. Okay, so let's do this. Okay. Show me your screen because I can't see what you're doing and I want to make sure you catch up with us. So show me your screen. Michael? Uh, it says it's sharing. It's not sharing. Oh, no, it's sharing. But, I mean, 
you're, you're on this screen. You need to get to the AWS workspace. Remember? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I must have shared the wrong screen. Then. Come on now, on this screen. Come on. This is exactly what I'm on. You're talking about the dashboard, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on that. Yes, I'm, I'm on that. Um, on. Let's see. Where is it at? Come on, Michael, share that screen. Let's go. <laughs> All right, we're getting a screen, and what do we got here? Michael, you're, you're showing me Planet Altic. Can you show me, open up another tab and show me aws.planetaltic.com? Yeah. Michael, what are we doing? I mean, you said do the planetaltic.com. That's what I'm doing. No, I said aws.planetaltic.com. In the chat, somebody put in the link. Go ahead and click on the link in the chat that they put there. And that'll take you right to the download. Okay. Okay, while you're doing that, Tamika, what do you got going on? This, this is, I don't know what to do. Because okay. I'm on the same page. That you just, I was just on this page. Yeah, this is not the right page. Michael, in the chat for Zoom, there are links in there that you can click on that will take you to the correct website. Can you click on in the chat? Tamiko, where do you got this going take, on? If this takes me back to the same screen I was just on, like, what is, I okay. mean, what am I supposed to be doing? No, no, you're fine. So, can you share your screen with me, Michael? Yeah, hold on. Why is it not? Now I don't want to let me log in. It's okay. We'll get there. That's exactly why I'm here. We're going to help you out. So if you can share your screen with me, I can tell you exactly what to type in, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we'll know if you don't have the access. Mm -hmm. Let me see. There you go. Okay, so... You got to validate that you're a person and you got to put in your password. A password is saved. That's what's crazy, bro. Right, but you, you have to validate that you're not a robot, too. Yeah. Okay. Now your password. Validate you're not a robot. Okay, so you're not authorized, right? So that's totally fine. Now what you need to do is contact your upline and let them know that you need their login and password to AWS, okay? And then it'll just let me download it, right? Well, it'll let you log into this. And once you log in, then you'll be able to download it, okay? All right. All right, Tamiko, what can we do for you? I'm pretty sure I am in the right place. However... My e app only has the option to update software. It That's doesn't. That's all right. You're good. You're in the right spot. So just stop. Heather Michaels, how can I help you? Hi. Sorry. Before I had to log out of Zoom and log back in. Anyway, um, I was able to download it. Um, it mine doesn't say sales though. It just says transmit applications and That's, update. No worries. That, it's completely fine. You're, you're oh. in the right spot. So we're about okay. to walk. Our pre, what you got for me? Our pre, what do you got for me? Okay, nothing. Uh, who's sharing Sorry. right now? I'm trying to, my, my bad. I was trying to share the screen. You are, you are sharing it, but what, what do you need from me? 
I'm trying to download the e app. And then when I download it, this comes up. Okay, so let me ask a million dollar question, Harpreet. Yeah. Million dollar question. Are you ready? Okay. Are you running an Apple computer? Yes. So I have failed yet again. I got to work on my abilities as a facilitator. You cannot download eApp into anything other than a Windows environment. Are you doing that? I. Could be, so I'm doing it on my uh, PC as well. To do it on your PC, not on your app, or not on your Apple, because Apple will not take this software to optimize only for a Windows environment, okay? Okay, let me do that again then. There you go, Bob Johnson, what can hey, I do? I'm, for I'm already in, but my uh, link goes right to policy search and I can't seem to get back to the homepage. I don't know what you're referring to. I'll share my screen if that's cool. Yeah, sure, absolutely. All right, one second. So click on eApp. Have you downloaded eApp yet, Bob? Um, yes, we. I did that with Amanda like a week ago. So why are we here then? Why aren't we in eApp? So this isn't the app? No. Oh, because this is the app profile. No, this is no, this is not eApp. This is a Windows. Uh, this is a browser-based reporting tool that okay. includes the download. So if you download it, you have eApp on your machine. Go ahead and search for eApp, and then launch the application. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Um, uh, Joe Jury, how can I help you? Real quick, so I can't get eApp because I'm on a Mac laptop, but I'm just gonna follow your yeah, lead, watch you and then i'll just do it on my other laptop later yeah absolutely no okay. worries man. there's a lot of information you're gonna get today even if you can't do it yourself it's fine okay okay so if i don't have any other hands raised so pre and bob your hands are still raised are you guys good for now yeah i'm good sorry all right no worries let's go all right so we're gonna come to this screen here uh this one here and as some of you said, you don't have anything but update software, maybe transmit applications, you don't have sales. The reason for that is because you haven't logged in and you haven't updated your machine. I think someone else, or your, your software, someone else had said, hey, I do this, but it gives me a version from two years ago. That's correct. When you first load this thing, it's not updated. It's from when it was released, uh, the last time it was updated and then put onto the server so that you can download it. So what you need to do now is if you only have update or sales, you need to click on one of these. So I'm going to click on update software. We are in the AO agency. And if you don't have an agency dropdown, don't worry about it. It will still work. And now you need to put in your username and password. Let's go to Nick Ferreira. What is the username and password that I'm going to put in here? You are going to put in uh, eApp training and then training as a password. Exactly. So eApp training and then the word training for the password and I'm gonna log in. And when I do that, it's gonna now go and check to see if it needs to update my software. For all of you, it probably, if you have never updated since you've installed it, it will take a while to update because it's got two years of updates it's gonna go through and your pipeline is gonna dictate how quickly it can update. I've seen people take three days to update, just so everybody knows. I've seen, when I do it, it takes me literally five minutes, but that's because I'm completely up to date. All right. So everyone should have logged in with eApp training, regardless whether you have your own login or not. I want you to use eApp training and then training. When you do that, you get this screen right here. Heather Michaels, how can I help you? Um, so mine says uh, I did eApp training and then is training the password all lowercase or uppercase or does it not matter? I think it's all lowercase. Okay, because that's what I did and it's saying login failed. The T is capitalized. Uh, oh, it is capitalized. Try that. Nope. Okay, do me a favor, share your screen so I can see it. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. EAP training does not have a space. Mm. It is one. Okay. That, so that did it. Comes together. Yep. So it's going to take a while. Just let it do whatever. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So now we're here at this screen. Uh, I'm sorry, Tamiko, how can I help you? I'm sorry. My system said that the updates were aborted. So it's not letting me update at all. It gets to maybe like four or 5% and it shuts down. Right. So there's an issue with you able to pull all of the information from the servers. Are you in your work office? I am. Yeah, so I'm suspecting that your work has some type of a firewall there. And so when you try to download the software, it's stopping it. So I would just go when you go home tonight, then you can download it from your house. You should be fine. OK, because I did that last night as well. It aborted and then I went from back in. House? Yeah, from my house with my upline. And I remember they said it could take days to download. Yeah. So when I opened today, I had the same message. It aborted. I thought maybe just because my laptop. It, I don't know. Do you have a Windows laptop? Is there? It is Windows based. How much? So you have to also make sure you have enough room on your hard drive to load it and mm -hmm. 16 megabytes of RAM so that you can run everything. Got gotcha. you. All right, I'll check in. Thank you. How can I help you? Um, so this EAB training login, uh, do you want to do, do you want everyone to use it or if we already have our own login, use our own? I, I do not want you to use your own login. Use the EAB training login, please. Okay, gotcha. This way I know that we can't accidentally do anything to your uh, login. You know what I mean? Because I have my own login, but I'm not using it. I'm using eApp simply because I don't want to make any mistakes. Jordan Rivera, how can I help you? Jordan Rivera, hey, everybody, if you want to chat with me, I got to at least be able to see you. I think that's fair, right? If your camera works, you should have it on if you want to chat with me. There you go, Jordan. Thank you. What can I do for you? Jordan, I cannot hear you, my friend. You're unmuted, but I still can't hear you. Yeah, just barely. Go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry for having my camera off. It's always freezing and stuff. No worries. Uh, but I was having an issue logging into eApp. So for the agency, what did you select? <laughs> it's AO. We're all part of AO. Okay, that's what I thought. And then it's one word for the login, eApp training, and then the password is training. Okay. And now you can turn your camera off. I can see it's horrible, my friend. Yeah, you got I got a new computer on the way. It will be here Friday. Nico, how can I help you? Hey, Sam. Uh, I know I used to be Art Altic Orlovich. Um, my e-app is just not downloading an updated version. It is 856 days old. Is it Altic Organization now on the agency login? It's just the letters AO. Okay. Well, I, I can't update my software for some reason, and I'm trying to re-download it, but it's still just uh, giving me the old software I had two years back but it won't update. I can't update because I don't, it doesn't show the new AO, Altic, it just shows the Altic Orlovich. From right, okay, ago. so we've that's got- what, That's what mine was, then I updated it and now all of a sudden it's only AO. Uh, I can't update it without having a login. Can you share screen with me so I can see it? Yeah, sure. Nick, while he's doing that, do you have a question for me? Yes, a um, couple questions. First off, uh, in in doing this, um, uh, the PDF said to uh, disable some of the security, um, so that so that we would be able to to download it. Now that it's downloaded, can I go back in and and uh, yes, change absolutely. the security settings back? Yeah, go back in and turn those security features back on. Okay. Now uh, I did all that yesterday. Um, I don't remember I, I, when I first went through this with my upline Begonia. Um, I didn't. Uh, I don't. I don't remember if she gave me her credentials or uh, if I used. You know, uh, probably used the AO training. But at some point, we're going to get our own credentials. Yes. Once you have that, once you're licensed. So here's what happens logistically. 
you take your state mandated training, you mm -hmm. pass your state exam. When you do that, you let AO know, or you let your admin or whoever or your upline know. They then let the admin know, who then sends it to licensing at AO, who then sends a letter to the state indicating that you're an agent for American income. Once they send that letter off, they will then issue you an agent number. Once they issue you an agent number, you'll be able to log in. Because when they do that, they're gonna give you a temporary login for EAP, okay? Okay, I've got, I've, I've done all that. I'll just have to look through my emails and find it. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. Uh, Nico, <clears throat> uh, can you share your screen again? Oh, uh, yeah, you... um, I believe I am sharing. I'll stop and redo it. Oh, maybe it's just me and I missed it. I think I saw it there for a second. Bring it up. And what I want you to do, see, uh, where did it go? Okay, so right there, I want you to type the letter capital A, capital O. Capital A, capital O. Capital A, capital O. All right, and then hit enter. Okay, and hit enter. Okay, so it's not giving you an agency. So what you need to do is you have to get rid of this version since you can't update properly. You okay. need to uninstall EAP <clears throat> and then go through the process and reinstall a new version. Because you're funny, even the funny old part is I've tried to uninstall it like at least half a dozen times. And it, when I re-download it, it brings us up the same version. And hmm. yeah. So we will have to have you contact IT support in your case. Okay. So you can't update it with Altic Orlovic. No. Because that's what I, and it it works. So now I see AO. And someone else just put in the chat, they did the same thing. Oh, you mean, can you put it, like he has Altic or like, and just pick that? Yeah, that and what? then I have to update, because mine was like over 600 days. Yeah, good. So I wasn't aware of that, because uh, Orlick is no longer part of the organization. Okay. So uh, Nico, can you share your screen again? And let's see if that'll work. I'm trying that as we speak. Okay, perfect. So you try that. And then, uh, Nick, you still have another question? Um, Sam, I believe it is not working because my upline was not part of AO back in the day. Okay, so when we, you got to call tech support things. You have a different problem above my capabilities, okay? I understand. Uh, just hold on, everybody, one second. Okay, uh, Brittany Shea, how can I help you? Yes, so I had it downloaded. You helped me last night and I got it. But when I try to get into it, it's saying critical error. And then it's saying I am have to restart the app and I do, and it's updated. It said the last update was done 19 hours ago. Can you show me your screen? Yes. <laughs> it is... That's the error I keep getting. So then I shut it down. And then when I try to do the login, it says it. <clears throat> Can you show me? Okay, so go ahead and shut it down. But show me not just this one little window. Show me your screen where you're trying to log in. And it says 20 hours. You can see this, right? No. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I'm still getting the hang of that. Um, right here. Okay, so select AO. I don't know what the thing is. It goes automatically. It's E app training, right? Well, E app is spelled with an E and then an A. And then and, training. And then click login. Show me what happens. What happened? Um, it keeps stop sharing, but it keeps going to that one screen, and it's saying you this. Gotta, 
Yeah, you got a critical error, so we're going to have to give you uh, the contact and tech support, okay? Okay. You, you both have a significant problem beyond my capability. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, Renee Zimmerman says try to restart your computer. So, yeah, maybe you can restart and see if that'll work. I don't know if it will. Okay, I'll try to start it. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, okay. Great. All right, everybody. So, I guess we've gone through the majority of the problems of logging in. So, now let's talk about. Yeah. Okay. So, here's the beginning of the screen. I'm going to go through all the various pieces. <clears throat> if you have a question, raise your hand and let me know. Here we go. So this is the very first screen that comes up. Over on the top left-hand corner, you've got file, referrals, video, tools, and help. Under file, you've got presentation and survey, super combo. That is exactly the same thing as this button right here, start presentation. You also have application package wizard. That's the same thing as existing applications. Then you have log off, exit, and submit sales and sales status screen. We're gonna come back to that particular selection uh, later on today. Referrals, you no longer have to worry about referrals because all of this work is being done in HB Pro as opposed to EAP. So don't worry about the referrals. Videos, <clears throat> this is if, uh, or rather when we were presenting in the home, there would be videos that would be available to us. We no longer worry about that because we're doing everything on Zoom, okay? Then you have tools, you have a backup manager. So basically what this is for is every single time you write an application, if for some reason you don't upload it into the cloud and you save it on your local computer, you wanna back it up. So if you need to come back to it and something happened to your computer, you can recover the application or applications. And the way this should work is you should select a backup directory that isn't on your hard drive because if your hard drive crashes, then obviously the backup is also lost too. So you typically put it on another hard drive or removable disk or something like that, okay? Then you can manage those backups and you can say what part do you want to back up? The app, recruiting referrals, sponsorship, or archiving the entire thing, okay? So that's the backup manager. I would advise everybody that when you have your own login on your computer that you create a backup directory that is not on your hard drive. And no. <clears throat> now over here, <clears throat> you have options. Those options would be obviously the backup path for the data where it's being archived, whether or not you're going to auto save. In my case, I have it done every five minutes. You would want to put in your agent number, your uh, city, state, and your address. But the most important part is the phone number. That phone number is going to be of the agency office. So mine is in Southern California. So I use that number. <clears throat> You uh, want to put something in there once you actually log in with your own agent ID, so that way everything works properly, okay? And then you can have balloon help if you wanted that to help you with any questions that you might have. Then you have a master form list that's here. When it pops up, there's nothing here. We're going to see all that later. And then you have help. Under help, you've got technical assistance. So if you had a problem like Nick and I think it was Brittany, you can send an email to eapphelp at AILife.com or you can call that number right there. <clears throat> so Nick, if you can see this, you should write down the email <clears throat> and that phone number so you can reach out to them to get assistance, okay? So that takes care of the technical assistance. Notice that you have the underwriting field manual that you can uh, click on which then creates or downloads rather a PDF file that looks like this. And that PDF file has all the information that you find in HB Pro. So it is here as well. If you wanna look up something you can, you can click on this. It'll take you right to that page and has all the exact same information. So the underwriting manual is there for you should you need it by clicking on help and then underwriting field manual. You can also get the uh, height and weight charts. And the reason I like the height and weight charts out of uh, EAP is if I'm writing a policy on somebody who is younger than the age of 18, when I scroll down here, I actually have age zero to 23 months and then age two to 15. So I have it all right there. It's the same information that's on uh, HB Pro. 
So again, when you click on the uh, e-app on help and you go to adult and juvenile height weight chart, it will download that PDF file for you, okay? So I did that and I want the PDF file because I don't want to go into HP Pro and show the client I'm looking at that. Again, that's one of those files I have right there available to me. So that when they tell me their height and weight, if it seems like it's out of whack, I can look at that chart and know if there's any issues there. Yeah, everyone tracking with me so far? All right. So that's the menus up here that you can get to. You got some buttons here. Uh, you've got where you can save. Uh, and we're in the training mode with the login. So no sales can be transmitted to the home office. So you can't hurt anything in this particular mode. So let's start the whole concept. So I'm in HP Pro. I've done everything. I now have a sale. I am ready to go and actually fill out an application. I'm going to click on start presentation. When I start the presentation, and everyone should follow along and do the same thing I'm doing, I'm going to type in the first name and then the last name. And when I do that, the description has the first and last name there. This name is just going to be the person that the file is under. It's not necessarily the person who's going to own the file or whatever. It's just that name that you put in there that the file is under. In this case, I'm going to say he's male. I'm going to say he was born on January uh, 1st of 1984, okay? Then it has a description. Then it has the agent number. Here, the agent is bogus-000. When you get your agent number, it'll be two letters and three numbers. If you move into leadership, then you will have two agent numbers. One is a management number and one is a producer number. Here, all of you should only have one when you get your actual login to eApp. Right now, everybody should show bogus right here. When you have multiple states that you're licensed in, you can um, click on this down arrow right here and every state that eApp knows that you're licensed in will be listed there. And then you can write a policy for that particular state, okay? You have to put the state in and it's two digits. So in this case, I'm just gonna say California, all right? When you log in as your own agent number, you have a choice in the sale mode. It could be a live sale or it could be a training sale. So everybody, when you're actually writing applications, you're going to click on live sale as opposed to training sale. Now, sometimes what people will do is they'll log in and they're going to train someone else and they'll log in with their actual uh, agent number, but they will select training sales. So that way they don't have any issues with the thing being uploaded into the cloud. Then you have the video language, doesn't matter because we're not gonna play any videos. The lead group tracking number and the group name, you don't need to worry about because all of that is coming out of HP Pro. Okay, so you don't need to worry about that here. And then you have the family status, single, single dependents, married and married with dependents. Once you have this filled out in this way, you do not click on next. You do not click on next. What you're all going to do is take your cursor and click on that red X to close this window. If you were to click on next, you will then be required to play all the videos that uh, agents had to play when they were in someone's home. Since we're on Zoom and since we're using HP Pro, we no longer need to do that. Okay, so you will not click on next here. You're going to click on the red X. That'll make this go away. Once you, that has gone away, you have a blank screen, you're gonna come up to file, and now we're gonna look for that particular application. So I'm gonna click on application wizard and every application that I've written or started will be here if I never uploaded it into the cloud. So I'm gonna look at John Doe, I've used him a few times. I'm gonna look for today's date. There it is, January 18th of 2023. Now I'm going to click on next and it will bring up this screen just to confirm I have it right. That's the guy's name. My agent number is this and my state is that. Everything looks good. Now I'm going to click next. Once I click next, I come up to this screen. Is anybody not at this screen that has the ability to get into EA? Okay, you're all at the screen. Now what I want you to do is click on add. And when you click on add, what it will do is it will ask you which one of the forms are you going to use? So Mary Frederick, based on the birth date 
of John Doe, which one of these forms am I going to use? Mary, are you there? Mary? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. All right, which um, one am I going to use? Which one would you use? Uh, Based on the, the birth that we put in for John Doe. Yeah, you're doing this with me, right? Real time? Well, I'm trying to fix my computer too. <laughs> okay, I'm having no, a hard time hearing. Okay, no worries. I got it. Door Stokes, which one should I pick? Super combo. Why is that? Because they're not a senior. They're not over 60. They're not 60 or older. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. So we pick the super combo and then it shows up right there. That's the super combo. We're going to take our thing. We can either double click on it or we can highlight it and click on edit. Either one. Once I do this, this is going to be an application that you will use most of the time for folks. Because uh, most of the applications you will write across the entire business is going to be super combos as opposed to seniors. Okay. Sam, so really quick. Sorry. Did you click on the applications and then hit next? I got lost when you clicked on it. Are you talking yeah, about right here? Yes. I just double clicked on super combo. Got it. Thank you. I haven't hit next yet. I'm not anywhere near that. Okay. If I wanted to, what would I do, Heather Michaels, if I had a husband that was 62 and a wife that was under the age of 60? What would I do? Um. You, you said a husband, what was the ages again? I'm sorry. The husband is over, is 62 and the wife is under the age of 60. Um, you would do the senior one, right? Well, the husband is over 60. So yes, I would do the senior for him, but for the wife, I would do the super combo, correct? Right. Right. So what I could do is I could actually go in here and I can add another one and I can actually add the, uh, sorry, click on applications, not on the super combo, click on applications, click add, and I can actually bring in a senior life combo. Now they're both in there. Got it. Okay. So that starts to get a little tricky. We'll get to that a little bit later. So I'm just going to remove that for now. And we're going to focus on the super combo. Okay. So this screen is now open and now I need to go through this. I'm going to walk you through how I want you to do it. So that way you have the best chance of closing your deal because you've already got them to agree to pay. Now we need to get through the minutia. So up here in the upper right-hand corner, what you're going to write in the veteran market is you're going to type in the word veteran. Okay. If you're in the credit union market, then all you need to do is type in credit union and then tell me which credit union they're part of. So in this case, in our examples in the past, it's been the Spokane City, correct? So I would type in Spokane City and then credit union. In the veteran market, I'm going to type in the word veteran. And then if I'm going to click there and I'm going to type in the word veteran again. Okay. That is key in the veteran market. You're going to type veteran and then veteran again. In the credit union market, you're going to click the CU box and you're going to tell me the name of the credit union. If it is a referral, okay, then regardless for the veteran, you don't need to worry about this. You're going to type in, or I'm sorry, you put an X in the REF box. So REF, because <clears throat> that stands for referral. If I'm in the credit union market, I'm still going to put REF, but I will put in Spokane City for the credit union, okay? This is very, very important because everybody will get credit for referral sales, but only if that box is clicked for referrals. So if you forget to put referrals in there and you submit the application, you will never get credit for that referral sale. In terms of the AO rewards program where you get one point for every referral dollar that you sell. Yes, Nick, how can I help you? What if it's not a referral? So if it's a credit union and it's not a referral, you're going to click on CU. 
and put in the name of the credit union. If it's the veteran, then you're going to type in veteran and not put anything in there. You'll click right here and type the word veteran. Okay. Thank you. So once you have that done and you know exactly what type of sale that you're making, now you can put in the information. So on 1A, the first thing I'm going to put in is Doe, and it's going to be John. It's the last name, comma, first name with no spaces. Then you're going to hit the tab. And the tab, next thing in yellow, it's going to say, I saw. All of us should put, I saw. Nick, do you have another question? Your hand's still up. Okay, so after I put in I saw, you're going to put in the birthday, okay? And the birthday in this case was 01-01-1984. So two digits, two digits, and then four digits for the year. When I hit tab, it automatically calculates how old that person is. Then I'm going to go to birthplace. He was actually born, uh, I don't know, California. You just pick it. Now, the thing here is that it starts off with all the states. Then it starts off with the, what is it, the territories, I think, in Canada. And then New Zealand, because that's where we sell. We sell in the U.S., Canada, and New Zealand. And then it lists every other country on the planet that they can potentially be born in. We don't use this information to determine anything other than statistical analysis. Okay? We just want to know where people are from so we capture this information. It's not used to determine rates or anything like that. Okay. Uh, okay. Next thing is the height and weight. So this person, when I click on that, it says feet and inches and then millimeters. So that's feet, inches, then millimeter. So in this case, I'm going to say 6'2". And when I do that, I hit tab one more time, it's automatically convert 6'2 into 74 inches. That's what's always displayed here is inches. Then I'm going to hit tab again. It's going to ask for the weight, either in pounds, kilos, or stones. Heather Michaels, how can I help you? So where where would we, we would already have like their information as far as how tall and how much they weigh, right? Like from the um, information that we get during the presentation, right? Uh, you tell me, at what point do you ask for their height and weight? in the presentation. Do you ever ask for that? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Does anybody, does anybody ask for their height and weight? No. In the no. Joe, you no, said you do. When do you ask for it? When you're uh, trying to see if they qualify under that. Um, I forgot what it was called when you check their weight and their height. You're talking about the four questions in the needs analysis? Yeah. There's no height and weight question in there. Oh, no? Okay, then I'm wrong. It's not in the medical questions either. So, I mean, you could look at them and have an idea, but you never actually have to ask for that until you get to this application. Okay? So, in this case, he's 6'2", and I'm going to say he's 215 pounds. I'm going to tab out. Boom, there it is. The very next thing you all need to do, and people forget this all the time because it's not highlighted in blue, is you need to put in the sex. People forget that all the time. The next thing is NTU. Is this person a non-tobacco user? So I'm going to say yes. I do not want you to fill in box two or box three at this time. Okay? Then you're going to go down to box four. Who's the owner of the policy? Is it going to be John Doe or is it going to be someone else? For our purposes right now, we're going to say it's going to be John Doe. John Doe is married. John is married to who? He's married to Mary. So I saw both of them and her birth date is 01-01-1985, luckily enough. And she was also born in California. And she's what five five and uh, five five. I would say let's say one fifteen. Okay, and she is a non-tobacco user as well. We already know that in box four, John Doe is going to own it. So now we go to box five: occupation and duties. What we want to know there is what do they do for work, or what did they do for work before they were either retired or unemployed. Okay, if they're retired, 
you can hit the down button and you can select retired. But look at his age. He's 39 years old. If you were to select retire, let's say he was in the military and he retired out either on a medical retirement or he put in his 20 and you put retired, more than likely underwriting is going to flag this and put it as a trial because they typically don't see people retired at the age of 38. All right. So at this age, what I'm going to do is put in what his uh, job was or what his job is now. Yes, he's prior military, but now what he does is he just does sales. Okay. And for her, I'm going to say that she's a teacher. Or actually, let's say she is, uh, I guess teacher's fine. It doesn't matter. Whatever they do, you put in here. Then you're going to move over to employer's name. Who did they work for? So he worked for ACME, and she works for the Florida Unified School District. Okay. So now I've got boxes one through six done, except for two and three, because I'm not doing that yet. Now I come to the address. Okay, so I'm just going to put 438 or 4378 Pocatello Drive. And I can't spell drive correctly. It's just disabled for her, sir. In San Jose, California. I'm sorry, what was that? It shows disabled for her job. Yeah, not 5101. So sometimes that will happen. I don't know why it does that. So I'll change it back to what it was before. Teacher, okay? So now it's a phone number here is going to be 555-555-555. Email address is going to be john at gmail.com, okay? Now we're finished with box nine. Now we're in box 10. We need to put in the beneficiary. So for him, the primary beneficiary is going to be her. So A here ties to A up here. So this is asking you, who's the primary beneficiary for A? In this case, it's going to be the wife. And you can just type in Mary Doe. It can be first name, last name. You don't have to do last name, first name. And then you're going to say uh, wife in this case to make it easy. And now there's going to be a contingent beneficiary. So that contingent beneficiary is going to be uh, Mark Doe. He's the son, okay? Good to go. Notice that there isn't anything available for her yet. Why do you think that is? All right, we'll come to that in a second. Now we're on box 11. Is any insurance applied for intended to replace or change any insurance or annuities in this or any other company? The answer to that question 100% of the time is no. The answer is always no. Renee Zimmerman, why is the answer always no? Um, I'm, you'll have to repeat the question because I was still filling in um, the address and all that. I was behind you. Why is the answer always no to question 11? What is question 11? Hang on, let me minimize. I'll look at it. Is any insurance applied for intended to replace or change any insurance or annuities in this or any other company? Oh, yes. You it can. You don't want to replace anything. Joanne, do you have a question or do you want to comment on the answer? Well, no, I was just going to comment on the answer. Well, what's your comment? My comment is we are only filling in the gaps, not, not intending to replace. Right. You're absolutely right. We are complementary. If there are insurance companies out there that will aggressively sell to replace what you already have. In order to do that, though, there's additional work you have to do that we do not do. So we are not in the business of replacing any insurance. We are here purely to be complementary and, as Joanne said, fill in the gaps. So the answer to number 11 will always be no. If the answer to 11 is always no, you will never fill out anything in question 12, okay? Because you're not replacing anything, we don't need to list any information. Question 13 is the impro, uh, sorry, is the proposed insurer a US citizen? In this case, the answer is gonna be yes. I will show you later what happens if you say no. Do you wish the automatic loan provision on your life insurance policies? Question 14, Devin Gould, what should that answer be? It should be no, we're not selling a variable insurance. 
Okay, so you're saying the question, the answer should be no because we don't sell variable insurance. Dave Garnett, what do you think the answer should be? Yes. Why? Because if something happens, you want the um, policy to be uh, provided for. Um, so if there's an issue and they have cash value built up, then they can take it out of the cash value to take care of the exactly. payment. So this is a good thing for our clients because they typically, here's what usually happens. Usually in years three, four, five, people move, people change banks, whatever the case may be, we're doing an automatic bank draw or a monthly bank draw from their bank, right? If they change it or there's no money in there, boom, it's going to trigger and we don't uh, lapse the policy. What we do is we give a mod in your inbox to whoever wrote the policy saying, hey, the banking information is incorrect, okay? Then me as the agent, if I wrote this, I'm going to reach out to that person saying, hey, the banking information is no longer working. There wasn't enough money in there. And typically the answer is, oh, I moved. I'm using a different bank account. Okay, give me the new banking information. I'll update it. Everything's fine. However, when people move, sometimes they change phone numbers and we can't get a hold of them. After year three in a whole life policy, you will start to accrue cash value. If you select yes on 14, we will then take the premium out of your cash value so that your policy does not lapse. So that is a very good thing that we're doing on behalf of our clients, correct? It is. So we will always put yes for 14. So now I've put 14, I said yes. I've gone through the beginning of this now. I have all the information. And now we're ready to actually put policy information in here. Okay? So down here, the first one here is going to be for A up here, John Doe. The second one, B, is going to be for B. In this case, it would be for Mary. C1, C2, and C3 would align with C1, C2, and C3 for the children. Okay? If I have more than three children, I can click on page three. And when I click on page three, you'll see that I have a whole slew of additional uh, spaces for C4 through C9. These are gonna be up to nine children with all the information on those children, okay? So if you have more than three, there's a way for you to write the additional information. So now I'm here, this should be wife. Sometimes stuff changes. Yes, Zuri, how can I help you? Um, what happens in the case of more than nine kids? Then we're going to uh, fill out another form that has additional information for all those additional kids. Okay. You could also write another application and you put the parent on there and just not sell them any whole life and then move the kids on there. Just like you were saying in A71 and one of the uh, uh, spouses don't qualify for whole life, you put the name on there so you can get the A71 right? You just don't sell them a whole life. So if it were me and I had, you know, 10 kids, I put the 10th kid on a different application, put one of the parents on there. I don't sell anything to the parent, but I put the kid for, let's say, the Head Start program. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep, absolutely. All right. So going back to page one, now I want to talk about actual policy information. All the rest of this is just trying to understand who is who, what is going on, all that good stuff. So I will then click on the A because that A ties with the A up here for John. And when I do that, once I click on that, this will then become available in just a moment that will allow you to fill in the field. See, they all turn blue. If you remember the other day when I was talking about policies, you have whole life in general, and then within the whole life construct, you've got four different levels, right? You've got whole life, premium, executive, and select life. All of that is broken down by how much coverage that you're going to provide. So Doris Stokes, you're going to help me with this. How much am I selling to John Doe for his whole life coverage? Doris, you're just giving me a number. Oh, I'm just giving you a number? Huh? Oh, 30,000. Okay, 30,000. So if I come here to whole life and I click on that, I can type in the face amount and we said 30,000. And let's say I hit tab or I hit enter. 30,000 shows up. That rate of $67.60 should match the rate that was in HB Pro for that individual at that age. 
as a what? As a non-tobacco user. So 6760 should match up very nicely. If I wanted to sell $120,000 or let's say 70,000, and if I put that in here and then I hit tab, what happens is I get this, exceeded the maximum number of units because there's a maximum number in the very first band. If I don't know the maximum number, say I forgot, just click OK, and it will tell you the most you could sell is 34999 for the whole life. So in my mind, it says, OK, I need to go up at least one band. So I'm going to click on premium, and then I'm going to type in 70,000, hit tab, and oh, now you've exceeded the maximum number. OK, so what's the maximum number in premium? It's actually 5999. So now the maximum of whole life is 34999, and premium is 5999. Okay, so maybe I go up one more band, type in 70,000, hopefully now it'll work, and it does. So 70,000. Mm -hmm. But what is the maximum for executive life? If I don't remember that it's 119,999, I can put in 150,000, hit tab. It tells me that, hey, if you see the maximum number of units, click OK, and there you go. 119,999. Okay, so that helps you understand which one of these you need to select because it won't let you put something in there in order to uh, select a number, okay? And remember, you're, you're taking all this information from HP Pro. I don't have to write anything, I don't do anything, so I'll have HP Pro up on another one of my screens and I'll just move back and forth between HP Pro and EAP, okay? Uh, and not only that, but when I'm having a conversation with somebody, I know if I sold them seventy thousand dollars in coverage, and I know if I sold them the eighty seven one. It's very simple for you to go from one to one. Okay. Are you still sharing at this point, Sam? Oh, so this entire thing you're sharing, all of this, you want the client to see the fact that you're filling in all this information. Okay. Absolutely, everything that I'm showing you, you want the client to see. So. Uh, um, going back to uh, Doris, she said 30,000, right? So yes. I did 30,000 here and tabbed over. It's going to tell me you failed to meet the minimum number of units, right? Because we know an executive, it's 120,000. So now I need to go back the other way. Well, I remember that it's a whole life and 30,000 fits in the whole life, right? So there you go, 6760. All right. Now, I need to do something for Mary. So Mary would be B, correct? At which point yes. are you screen sharing EF? As soon as you, without the client, Heather, I don't know your, I don't understand your question. You are sharing EAP the moment you bring it up. That's what you're sharing with the client the entire way through because they have to answer all these questions that you're going to walk through. Uh, I no not really uh i thought we were sharing like our hp pro like presentation with them you are but once you're done with the presentation they said i want to go ahead and buy now you're going oh. to share yeah okay done. Yeah. that makes sense <laughs> no no worries okay so now i want to fill in the information for who do we say her name was mary okay so mary's in b why in the world can I not get B to show up like I had it over here for uh, A for John Doe, right? You have to click on B. Okay, I'm clicking on B and nothing's happening. Okay, this happens all the time with students. So where the heck is the problem? Come up here and notice I did not give her a sex. This happens all, all the time with the classes. They forget that they got to do that. And it's because the sex is not highlighted in blue. So everyone remembers, oh yeah, I've got to get that done. So we need to change the sex to female. And once the sex change to female and the system catches up with you, uh, see how it's doing that, it's recalculating everything. And now it will give us access to the B so that this way I can actually give her policy information. See how the B turned into a blue? Now I can click on B. And now, once I do that, I can sell her, or I can put the information in for the policies that I'm gonna sell her on the whole life side. So there's no B under 10. Oh, well, there's no B on 10. Yes, yeah, so you're right. But 
that has to do with the fact that you will not have one there until you click a B down here. Okay, and the reason for that is we know that if you have a policy typically up here that's an A, you almost will always have uh, the policy written for that A person, a whole life policy where you need beneficiaries. You may have a wife, but you don't necessarily write the policy on the wife that's a whole life because maybe you're including her the name for the A71, but she may not qualify for a whole life or she may not want to buy a whole life policy. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, this keeps changing on me. I don't know why, but the system sometimes will do that. All right, so now I'm here. So Dora Stokes, how much coverage are we writing on her? Let's do 32,000 for her. 32,000. So we know it's going to be a whole life. I'm going to type in 32. doesn't matter if that zero is right there. In front of the three, hit tab, it's 5830. Okay. So that's just the whole life for each one of them. Underneath each one of them, you've got all these writers. You have the terminal illness writer, which is the TIR, and then you have additional policies, the 10-year RNC, the ADB, the B2000, waiver of premium, uh, the child writer, and the spice writer, okay? Mine, when I did 32,000, it says $80.94. Mine too. What state are you in? Mine has a completely California. different... Well, it may have a different rate. Don't be concerned about it. You're in training mode. So the rates are actually tied to the actual rates if you were selling this. Okay. okay. Uh, Sandra, your hand is raised. What can I do for you? I was just going to mention the same thing as um, Doris. So I'm good. <laughs> okay. So I'm here. If we remember in HB Pro... What is the writer that we always provide with every whole life policy we sell? Anybody? A waiver premium? No. Terminal illness. Is it the A71, the accident writer? No, the accident's not a writer, it's its own policy. The terminal illness writer, was that you, Dave Gonnett? Yep. We always provide the terminal illness writer. Remember when we go to uh, protections and writers, that terminal illness writer is always there 100% of the time. So that means we need to add that writer, which is right there, TIR. So we're going to add the TIR for each one of them because it doesn't cost them any money to get that writer. Yes, Sharday, how can I help you? I don't have that button, the TIR. So would I just add it underneath child? You don't have what? You don't have the TRR right here where I'm showing it? Right. Uh, shoot, that seems kind of odd to me. Uh, I'm not doubting you, don't get me wrong. Can you share your screen so I can see it? You might sure. need to scroll down. Survey says... Wow, you really don't have it, do you? Scroll down. Oh. No, she doesn't have it. But you know what? You're in a different. Uh, you're in a different state altogether. You're not. What state are you in? Oh, I did this for New Jersey. Ah, see, so that's okay. This is a great example of different states have different requirements, and so this form will change depending upon the state. If you look on hers next to the accident insurance policy, so move your cursor down, right down there, her accident insurance policy, she has nothing to the right, right? It's a complete blank white space, whereas mine is going to be filled. So apparently in New Jersey, we don't offer the terminal illness rider. So we okay. just found that. Good yeah. to know. Yep, good to know. All right, so now, and I think... Yeah, good to know. So it's interesting. When you do HP Pro, have you ever used New Jersey as the state? Always. Okay. And when you do that, when you cl click on protections and writers, does it list the fact that the TIR is available? Um, I don't think so. But when you get I, a honest, I honestly never even noticed, but I didn't see it. When you get a chance, check that out and see if that'll show up for you. Okay. Sure. That's uh, interesting. But, and again, now we're looking at my screen and notice that I do have 15, 16, and 17, right? I don't have a blank space. 
So this again goes to show that different states have different stuff. Yes, Joanne, how can I help you? Okay, maybe this is going to sound so silly, but when you're clicking the whole life policy for each of them and you're uh -huh. putting in the face amount, uh -huh. refresh my memory. Why do we choose the 30,000? Is there, Why do we choose any specific number? Is because there like a number, set amount? No, it's the number that came from HP Pro. You, you're the okay. one that gave them the plan and recommended it. And if you were successful in having them pick one of the plans, that's the okay, number. Okay. okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. Right. So we always <laughs> include, if we can, the terminal illness rider. Okay. Always, 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 if it's there. The other thing here I want to show you is right here, you have this LPU 65 for both of them. What that means is a life paid up at 65. Okay. If you were to select that, let's say I selected that for him, look what happens to my premium. My premium jumps, uh, sorry, let me put in 30,000 again, and my premium will jump $77.08. Bob Johnson, why does my premium go up if I select the paid up to 65 option? Um, looking for the mute. My mute button is hidden. Sorry. We can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, cool. That's why it's hidden. Um, because he's paying it off um, faster. Yeah, he's paying it off at 65 as opposed to when do people typically die that are males in the United States? 76 or 80, or it depends. I think it's 76. So we aren't going to use that too often because that's going to make the rate more expensive. Okay. So usually in HP Pro, we don't select the uh, paid up option. So change this back to 30,000, and that should give us the rate uh, that we had before, uh, whole life at 30,000, that would help. All right, 67.60. Over here now, you've got the 10-year RNC, the ADV, all the stuff I talked about before. If I'm in the credit union market, will I always include, for those of you in the credit union market, will I always include a 10-year RNC to protect income? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the whole point, right? However, you don't have to. If you decide that you, you know, that, that it's too expensive and they want to lower it by a few bucks, you can always take that off. You're just then saying, hey, we're not protecting your income. If you do include it, then in the HP Pro, it'll pop up as income protection for one year, right? So in this case, I'm just not going to add it. We could if we wanted to, but I'm not going to. So each one of these has TIR. We're good to go. If I had any children, then it would show up over here as a child. So let's do that. Uh, we said Mark, right? So in here, I'm going to say Doe and comma Mark. And I saw them and his birthday. Uh, well, I'll try to do this. I'm waiting for the system to catch up. Because now that I've added Mark, the system knows I have additional people. So it'll catch up and I'll be able to hopefully add it. Okay, so there we go. The birthday. So I just love HP Pro because sometimes it can be very, very slow. Come on. All right. Did it work? All right. So boom. Anyway, we're adding a child and you can add up to three. Okay. Yes, Harpreet. While I'm waiting for this, how can I help you? What's that button next to the names? Uh, the little, the people button? Like on the left? Yeah, so I, in, yes. it's an individual. Let's say I don't want to add Mark. I accidentally put it in by mistake. I can come over here and I can uh, click, right click actually that, and I can remove this person. See, it comes up with the word clear. Okay. Uh, you know, the little person, and it will get rid of that. It'll ask me, hey, do you want to remove that? I'll say, okay, and then all those people will go away. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. So let's just skip the child for, for right now. We'll come back to that. All right. So now I've got the policy set up the way that I want. I'm selling 30,000 whole life for uh, him, uh, sorry, for uh, him and $32,000 for her. Now, once that's completely done, I'm scrolling down because now I have the A71, the cancer policy, the hospital indemnity, as well as critical illness. So the A71 is right here. I sold a family plan to that family, should I click on A or should I click on B, Devin Gould?
Okay, so you click on A and B in the accident policy. Well, if they're both getting the accident policy, A would be the dad, B would be the mom. So we'll start with A. So if I click on A, then it shows up and only the individual is available to me. Right? So you're right. So you're, you're, you're correct. But here's the process. I've got to click on both in order to get that family to show up. Okay. Okay. So now I want to click on B and now it knows you're going to do a family. Notice that there's no amount per day here yet until you select either individual or family. I select the family and now it gives me a drop down of $100 to $500. So going back to Doris Stokes, which one did we provide? Uh, $300. $300 a day. I'm going to click on $300. And now that $1,350 right there in the premium will match what is in HP Pro. So if I put a policy or a presentation together in HP Pro where I was going to offer $30,000 a whole life to the husband, $32,000 a whole life to the wife, and a family plan for the A71, we're going to find that it is going to be $139.40 in HP Pro, but right here it shows $144.40. Why is that, Joe Nava? Uh, Mohammed Hussein, why is that? I'm not actually sure. Because right there, policy fee of $5. It is a one-time charge. So we don't put that in HP Pro because in HP Pro, we're putting in, this is the amount that's going to cost you every single month. When we go into the application, we show that A is a $5 fee. For each one of these, there's an additional fee. Okay, so in the cancer, uh, say, let's say, uh, sorry, cancer, if we're doing a, a cancer policy for the family, we did five units, there's a $5 fee. If we do the hospital indemnity for the family, it is a $10 fee. And if we do critical illness for the family, it is a $5 fee. So $5, $5, 10, and then uh $5. So it is a processing fee to get that policy initiated. Okay. That's why the number over here will be off by at least $5, whatever you include the A71. Any questions about that? So I'm going to turn these off because I don't have it. Yes. Chardé, how can I help you? Um, so the cancer and the hospital indemnity, that's not the A71? No, the A71 is accident insurance policy right there. That is the Okay, A71. so I guess because I'm not, be, or because I'm in New Jersey, I can't sell that either? That's probably correct. Okay. So okay. you're going to get uh, non-resident state licenses, and you'll be able to sell it to other states. Just New Jersey is a little bit of a tough sell. New Jersey okay. and New Jersey, all right? Okay. Okay, so uh, sorry, Samuel, how can I help you? So where it says under mode of premium, do you have um, options to change it to an annual payment? And would the price go down for that? No, the price never changes. There's no prepaid discount. So you can click on that down arrow and you can get annual bank draft or quarterly bank draft. We okay. would prefer that as a monthly bank draft, but you can change it if you want it. Okay. If the client said, yeah, I just charge me once a quarter, you could do that or even once a year. But if we did that to ABD to uh, annual, then that number is going to jump from 144 to what? 139.40 times 11 plus the 144.40. Okay. So $888. But typically we leave it at the monthly bank draft. All right, so we've done all that. Now here in the A71, this is something that we don't talk about in HP Pro, but I am very, very supportive of doing this. You'll notice, uh, sorry, I'm changing it back to MBD, but you notice right here, it says optional recuperation writer. All right, so Joanne, if I'm selling you the A71 for you and your family, 
and I say, hey, we're going to do three hundred dollars. So if you have to stay overnight in the hospital, uh, we're going to give you a three hundred bucks for every day that you're in the hospital. And you're like, okay, that sounds great. But then, Joanne, what if I told you that, hey, if you're injured in an accident, I can arrange it so you don't have to stay in the hospital at all for every day that your doctor says that you can't go back and do the things you were doing before or you can't go back to work, I will still pay you that $300 a day. Would that have value to you, Joanne? Yeah. Would it have incredible value? Or you're like, yeah, yeah, of course. Yep. Would it have incredible value, right? Yeah. Because, Joanne, if you're injured in an accident, do you want to stay in the hospital? No, nobody wants to be in the hospital. <laughs> right, because you're susceptible to all the stuff in the hospital, potentially. Right. You right. want to get out. So when I talk to clients and I tell them that, I'm like, hey, I want you out, but I want to make sure you still get paid. Most times people will say break a leg in an auto accident, fall down the stoop, whatever, and they're injured. Okay. But they don't want to stay in the hospital. They want to go to the emergency room. So a 300 bucks. I'm going to give them $150 for just the hospital visit. Sorry, just the emergency room visit, right? Then if I said, okay, I'm going to give you $300 a day, up to 365 days, but your doctor has to say that you're not able to go back to work or you're not able to do the things you were enjoying doing before, then it has huge value. Now, that's going to cost you a little bit more money, so let's understand what that means. Right here is the optional recuperation rider. I'm going to click on that. And when I click on it, it's going to say single or double, either multiplying the rate that you're going to get by one or by two. Let's just say single. The cost right now is $13.50. When I click on that, the cost goes to $15.38. That means if Johnny gets in an accident at school and can't go back to school for seven days, we're going to pay the family $2,100 even though Johnny didn't have to stay in the hospital. I had a student in this class who was a uh, phlebotomist and she was in an accident where she broke both her ankles. She could never go back to work. I, I, I don't, maybe I have the wrong uh, vocation, but she was doing something where she was in a medical environment and she had to be on her feet. So she broke both her ankles and she could never go back and her ankles never healed properly. So she was never really able to go back to work. So in that instance, we would have paid her $300 a day for all 365 days. And that has nothing to do with workers' comp. It has nothing to do with short-term or long-term disability. This money is being paid directly to the individual. The reason that I'm passionate about this is because if you do this right and you present it in the right way, this almost always closes a deal where people will not cancel on you just because of this. Now, they may come back and say, hey, I can't afford $146 a day. Not a problem, but I really think you should keep that. Let's take your price point lower down a little bit on the whole life, right? But they want to keep the policy going because they know how valuable it is to them should they get injured in an accident. And you have to have a whole life policy in conjunction with A71. You can't write an A71 policy by itself. Now, if I told all of you that I'm going to give you that for $2 a month, would all of you be willing to pay $2 a month for that? Probably, right? I know I would. And my kids are all growing and out. But if I had children, oh, heck yeah. Because we know that, hey, somebody's going to break an arm. Right? If my son broke his arm, let's see, he broke his arm. I went to daycare. This is years ago, right? Went to daycare. So I would have got 150 bucks for leaving work, which would have been nice, right? For having to take time off work, go to the emergency room. And then he couldn't go back to school from Tuesday to Friday because they had to get the cast, they had to set it, et cetera, et cetera. So I would have got three days at $300 a day plus the 150. I would have got over $1,000 because my son broke his arm. That could make all the difference for a parent that has to leave work to take care of some child that they had that was in an accident, right? The whole reason we put this together back in the day is because union folks, mostly blue collar, would get injured potentially on the job or wherever. And if they didn't or weren't able to go back to work, they didn't get paid. So we ostensibly set it up that if, hey, if you get injured and you spend the night in the hospital, we're gonna pay you. And then we said, okay, if you pay us a little bit more, 
as long as a doctor says you can't go back to work or you can't do the things you were enjoying doing before, like retired people, then we are going to make sure that you still get paid. Huge value to me. And to me, this is the number one thing that keeps policies intact. So I'm just going to go ahead and add it. I would advise or recommend or, or passionately recommend that all of you include that every single time you sell, because it's very easy to say, hey, for two bucks a day or whatever it is, you're going to have that. And if you do that consistently, you're going to find that people will keep their policies in place. Yes, Doris, how can I help you? Just to make sure I'm following, why did you do single for family? Well, because this is talking about how much it's going to multiply that number for the payout. So you could do double and the cost will oh. then go. 38 to 17.25. Okay, got it. So the additional is the $13 more per month that they'll pay to get that rider added on. Well, no, if you take the rider off, 13.50 is what the normal cost would be that HP Pro shows you for A71 for a family. Oh. It, it moves from 13.50 to 15.38. So that's what I'm talking about. It's less than two bucks. Got and it. the value is through the roof. All right, so we've done that. We added that in there. You could add a cancer insurance policy, a hospital indemnity insurance policy, and a critical illness. If you do the hospital indemnity, you can also get an op optional recuperation rider, but not on cancer and not on critical illness, okay? So now we've gone through all of those. Now we're at 15, 16, and 17. 15, I have received an outline of the coverage. If you sell one of these, uh, A71, cancer, hospital, or critical illness, then you have to click one of these. So for each one that you sell, you have to click in here because when you do that, a form is going to come up. So if we look over here in this window, if I take that away, then that form goes away. Let's do this. Okay. So there's no forms over here other than the super combo. The moment I click on A71 because I sold it to them, that form will come up. That form is a disclaimer. Gives all the information about the A71 that's being provided with that particular policy. Okay. I'm not going to add cancer or hospital or critical illness because HP Pro, we typically don't have that. However, you could sell that if you wish. Okay. There's nothing that says you can't do that. 16. Does the proposed insurer have a Medicaid eligibility card or otherwise eligible for benefits under Medicaid? You just ask the question Hey, do you have Medicaid? Do you have access to Medicaid? So yes or no. If the answer is yes, then you put yes. If the answer is no, you put no. And then for 17, only if they're 65 or older, you're going to click on yes. Because some of the stuff that we offer, in fact, duplicates some of the benefits they get through Medicare. So again, that's just going to be a disclaimer and letting them know that's the case. Tara Magnum, how can I help you? I clicked on my A71 on number 15. I got no form pop-ups. That's okay. It'll show up in there eventually. It's probably <laughs> behind your e like application. Mine was behind it. I had to minimize the screen. Do you, you have this window right here up, Tara? Tara, do you have yeah, that window? Yes. yes. And, and all you see is the super combo? Well, now I've got... There it is. I see it now. I see okay. it now. And the other question I had was the cancer insurance policy because I'm in Texas. Mm -hmm. I've got two options. I've got a CNM or a C20. Yeah, it's two different types of cancers. One is an initial payout and the other one's uh, a little bit different. So you'd have to go and look at the different policies that are available in Texas. Okay. okay. Thank you. So we're here now. We've uh, gotten through the first page and Kelly McDowell, do we email it to him? Well, what will happen is every single form that will show up here eventually will all be part of the DocuSign email that gets sent to them for signature. So they see everything that you're going through. Okay. Next thing, we've done all that down here, authorization for pre-authorized payments. I do not want you to fill this out. So on the first page, the things that don't get filled out initially are section two, section three, and the banking information down here. Okay, we're going to walk through that later. But when you actually do this with a client, I want you to do this in this order. Now that we selected uh, information for what we're selling to the wife, this pops up here. So now I can give the beneficiary information. 
In this case, we know it's going to be John Doe, and he is the husband. And we'll say the son again is going to be the contingent beneficiary. So on the first page, everything now is filled out the way it needs to be filled out. And now we're ready to go to page two. Page two is all the medical information. Yes, Sharda, how can I help you? Sorry. So you said that um, when we're actually doing this, you recommend that we ask for the sensitive information at the end, or is that just for the exercise purposes? You're talking about the banking information and the social security number and the driver's license? Yes. Okay. So yeah, let me go ahead and talk about that now. So I am not a fan of asking for that up front. And the reason I'm not a fan is because you think about how I think about sales. You know, I want to put you, I want to take you off the island, right? I want to give you something and then take it away. In this case, I want them to see everything that's required, okay, to fill out an application with their own eyes and they're answering questions. Psychologically, if I get all this information, and then I go to page two and I get all of this information. So now they've shared with me all their medical information, right? I know everything about them in terms of the application. And now let's assume that, and we're gonna do this after the break, that I've gone through all this information on page two. Now I'm gonna to go to page one and I'm gonna say, okay, now I just need your social security number, driver's license and banking information. The likelihood that they're going to be willing to give it to me now that they see it's one, it's required, and two, I've already obtained from them all this other information, they're more than likely going to give it to me, okay? Versus if I say at the very beginning, hey, I just need to go ahead and have you grab your driver's license and your banking information and we'll fill out the app. If you told me that and I'm buying from you or I think I'm going to buy from you, I might go, oh, hold on a second. Whoa, 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 and now I'm gonna give you an objection that you have to spend time overcoming. Does that make sense? I've seen plenty of agents and even senior agents do it that way. Hey, just go ahead and grab your checkbook and your uh, driver's license. We'll get this done you know, really quick. Yes, you can do that, but more often than not, particularly with uh, new agents, they run right into the buzzsaw. Uh, and remember, most of the folks in the veteran market anyway are older, they're going to be like, uh, yeah, no, no, hold on. Why do you need that from me right now? What's going on? So rather than do it up front, it doesn't take long to fill out this application. Literally, it's five minutes, maybe 10 at the most. Okay. I know it's taken us long to go through every piece, but when you actually start writing business, it's very quick. So if psychologically I've gone through all of page one and then I jump to page two and I get all your medical information and then I say, Chardet, hey, we're almost done. All I need now is your driver's license information and your banking information. You're more prone to give it to me because you see that one, you've given me all this other information and two, it's required, which is why I want everybody to share their screen with uh, eApp so that people see that it's required. It's not something me asking you because I want your banking information. It's required. I have to actually fill it out in order to submit the application. Does that make sense, Chardé? Yeah, good advice. Thank you. And again, I don't want to harp on this too much, but when I first started, the way that I learned, because no one knew I had sales experience, it's like, hey, Sam, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to page one, fill it out, and then you're immediately going to ask for uh, all this information. And I said, well, okay. And I, I did that a number of times, and I would always run into, well, why do we need to do that now? Why do you need my banking information? You don't need that. Just send me the bill and I'll write a check. So you create objections right. that you spend time overcoming. I'd much rather wait, so just to be clear, there are sometimes going to be people who tell you, I don't want to give you my banking information. Okay, You can't uh, do the sale without it. Okay, if that happens, I'd rather spend five minutes to have that happen once out of 300 applications then not to spend the five minutes to fill it out and have the objections come up 10 times out of 300 applications. That's my mindset because it's, for me, the entire sales process is psychological, right? It's the transfer of emotions, et cetera, et cetera. I'd much rather have somebody say, oh, you've given, or I've given you all this stuff. The next step makes sense that I'm going to give you a way to pay for it. 
Okay. Uh, Joe Nava, how do you overcome those objections? I don't feel comfortable giving you that information. Oh, you're talking about the banking information? Yeah. So I've run into that before. And you may hear other people run into that. It's like, well, I don't want to give you my banking information. Well, keep in mind, uh, Joe, I've got all your medical information. You already gave me your social security number. And I'm licensed by the state of California, in the state, I guess California, right? I'm licensed by the state of California to do this job. I do this all day long. I talk to 10, 12 people every single day getting all this information. So this is what I do. And in, in addition to that, Joe, I'm not going to do anything with it that you don't know. As a matter of fact, when we're done finishing this, the system is going to send you an email that has all this information in it. So you can see where I had to fill everything out. You can take a look at it. And when you sign it, indicating that, yes, I want to apply for the application, then you know that all that information is going to be used as part of the application process. So those are things that I say to uh, initially try to overcome the objection. And then based on whatever they say after that, then I just kind of weave with them and try to get them to go. I've had one person tell me that they won't do that. They will not give me the banking information. So it happens, but it's pretty rare. Yes, Chardé. Um, I was just going to make a comment on that. Troy uh, Plummer, his presentation yesterday, um, the guy actually said, um, you know, why are you asking me for that sensitive information? And he said, um, well, you know, there could be another Joe Schmo, and we just need to make sure that we're paying the right person with your social. So <laughs> that helps. Okay, <clears throat> for me. Then he showed how the numbers started disappearing too when he typed them in too. That made him feel better. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. So, so Troy, <laughs> Troy said, I need your social security number so that way we pay out the correct person. And the the client said, okay, that makes sense. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hey, whatever works, but think about it logically, right? The social security number is not for the person we're going to pay out. It's for the person that is has the insurance on them. So when uh, Sam dies, <laughs> sorry, when Sam dies, the money's not going to Sam, right? It's going to my beneficiary. So I would prefer, I mean, if it worked, it worked, that's great. But I would prefer that people know the reason we need your social security number is because we are going to track all the information about your medical background and make sure everything ties together, right? With the medical information board, with the other 15 areas, we get all that information. And it has to be for you. It's unique for you. That's why we need the social security number, right? Because that's how the MIB tracks all the information about you based on your I social guess don't tell them that I told you that. <laughs> no, I'm not. And it, like I said, if it worked, then go with it. I just want you to think about logically what happens is that if I die, then my social security number doesn't matter as long as I know that I, I'm dead. The other thing is, is your social security number put on the death certificate? I think it is. I think it is because when you can look on the internet, you can see the roles of everybody who's died, right? It'll have, it won't have the social security number, it'll have their name. The reason they can track it is based on your social, okay? So... Troy is right in one sense that the only way for us to pay it out is we have to verify that that person with that social security number actually died. Does that make sense? So that, I think you just said it wrong or whatever, but it, sorry, I laughed. The way you said it initially was kind of humorous. But yes, we do need the social security number to verify you're the person that died. Okay. Uh, no more questions. I obviously need to take a break because I'm laughing too much. We're going to start on the second page. Let's come back in 15 minutes, so that would be what? I can't do the math in my head. That would be 15, 21 minutes past the hour, is that correct? All yeah. right, 20 minutes past the hour, I'll see everybody then, thank you. On to the next page, page two. <clears throat> Who do we got? We got Tara, we got Samuel, Muhammad, Bob, Bob is always there. Chardé, Renee, all right, people starting to trickle back in. That's great. Here we go. Page two, let me share my screen. Okay, there we are. We are now moving to page two. We've done page one with the exception of section two, section three, and the banking information. 
So on page two, this is where we have the medical questions. These are the same questions theoretically that you're going to see in HB Pro. Now, keep in mind, as Chardet pointed out to us, she's in a different state. Every state will have a different version of this page. Some of them will all be the same. Some will be different. It just depends. Whatever questions are here, though, you are required to ask <clears throat> and you're required to read them verbatim initially. So has any proposed insured ever been treated or advised to be treated for alcoholism or alcohol abuse, including membership in AA, or been advised by a physician to reduce alcohol consumption? Sorry about that. A little bit of a cough. Okay. So you're going to put yes or you're going to put no. In this case, we're going to put no. All right. If we look over here on this part, anything I put yes over here may result in another form popping up. So if I put yes, and I say it's going to be for John, and I'll close that, and all of a sudden, now you got alcohol exclusions, right? So we'll come to that in a second. Have you ever used drugs not prescribed by a physician, such as cocaine, amphetamines, barbiturates, hallucinogens, tranquilizers, narcotics, or sedatives? In this case, we're going to say no. But if I did say yes, it would ask me which one and who either alcohol excess or drug use, okay? So we know the answer is going to be no here. Have uh, the have you, and I'm asking the client this, right? Have you ever had your driver's license suspended or revoked because of a movie violation, been convicted, including driving while intoxicated or under the influence? Okay, if you say yes for either one of them, you're going to get another questionnaire that'll pop up over here. Okay, so every time you say yes, boom, you get questionnaires that you will then share with the client after you get through with all the questions, but you could do it real time. Like if they said, yes, here, okay, let's fill that out. It's my experience though, that get all the questions answered first. That way, if anything pops up here that they're not going to be able to receive insurance or they're gonna get declined, that you take care of that prior to filling all this stuff out. Does that make sense? So in this case, we're gonna say no, take that off and now you can see they go away. We'll say no. Has the proposed insured or client, have you flown within the last two years or intend to fly in the future as other than a passenger on a scheduled airline? Heather Michaels, what is the answer to that question? I'm sorry, which uh, for number 22, 21? Yes. Um. Yes. So have you flown within the past two years or intend to fly in the future as other than a passenger on a scheduled airline? Oh, no, sorry, no, 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 no. So what do you think that question is trying to determine? Um, uh, risk, obviously, but um, what kind of risk? I don't know. Right, because if you're a pilot or if you're in a uh, job that requires you to fly more often than the average traveler, then your risk profile would go up, correct? Right. However, we're not actually asking you, are you a pilot or you have a job where you uh, fly other than a scheduled airline, right? We ask you, according to the attorneys, <clears throat> have you flown within the last two years or intend to fly in the future as other than a passenger on a schedule online? So we're asking the same information, but we're doing it in a way without doing what? Discriminating against pilots, correct? Right. Yeah. So once you ask that question, after you ask it exactly the way it's written, if they go, well, what, what does that mean? Then you can say, well, this is asking you if you're like an attendant on an airlines and or if you're a pilot. Because if you're a pilot, and if I were to click yes, you're going to get this over here. So let's say yes. Let's say it's going to be John, close, aviation questionnaire. Okay? So okay. that's what's... 22, has the, have you participated within the last two years or tend to participate in any of the following activities? Auto motorcycle, boat racing, parachute jumping, skin, scuba, or skydiving? Oh, Heather, you're going to be my go-to, my, my role play. So what's the answer? Um... Oh, hold on. You could pick yes or no. Do you do any of those things? Uh, no. What's that? No. No, okay. 
Uh, have you ever been advised to take tests not done so or not received the results been diagnosed as having or received treatment for high blood pressure, chest pains, heart attack, stroke, or any heart blood or circulatory disorder other than HIV? No. And you can pick yes or no, just so you know, in any one of these questions, okay? Okay. Have you ever had or been treated for any of the following conditions, diabetes or other endocrine disorder? Uh, no. Paralysis, epilepsy, mental disease or disorder, or any other nervous system or brain disorder? Um. Yes. Really? Yeah. Wouldn't like depression or something be under a mental disease? Right. But like most people are not going to view depression, right? I will. I guarantee you, most people will not view depression as a brain disorder or something like that. So, based oh. on that question, they're probably going to say no. However, let's say that uh, you have epilepsy. Okay. Okay. All right. So Mary has epilepsy. You're going to play the role of Mary. We'll say close. Seizure questionnaire shows up over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had arthritis or any injury too, or trouble with your back, knees, or any of your joints? Yes. Oh, okay. So that's going to be you. We're going to go to Mary. Is it arthritis or back and joint? Arthritis. Arthritis. Click close. And the arthritis questionnaire pops up here. Okay. To the best of your knowledge and belief, do you have any physical impairment or departure from good health? So here's what happens. We ask you all these questions, but we know that we can't ask every single question that there possibly is. So we have this catch-all in section B. And the catch-all is, hey, you need to disclaim if you have anything else that we haven't asked you about, that's where it would be right, I'm sorry, question 25. That's where question 25 would come in, okay? okay. So let's say you said no, okay? You've disclosed everything. Yes, Dave, how can I help you? On question 24, um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you click on yes and you look for the thing, it says epilepsy, depression, and then it says paralysis, other nervous system, brain disorder. Yes. So Heather just said, would you click that if you had, if you'd listed depression? Right. But I, <clears throat> it's not asking you. So oh, if I, I question 24, it doesn't actually ask the question, do you have depression? Does it? Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. So we'll come back to that and okay. why. That is, for the sake of argument, uh, I'm sorry, I lost the name. Who, who was I talking to? Heather? Heather, me. Heather, okay, Heather, we're just going to say no, okay? Okay. And then we'll come back to why the why we need to fix that. Okay, so we said 26 is no, 27. Have you ever been advised to take tests and not done so or not received the results, been diagnosed as having received treatment for cancer, tumor, unexplained mass? The answer is? Uh, no. Okay. Wait, where no. are you at? Oh, okay, I see. No, yeah, it's no. <clears throat> okay, and then I'm going to go to the top of the form. Up here to 28. Has the proposed insurer in the last five years had a physical examination? 100% of the time, you're going to say yes. Yes. Yes, 100% of the time, <clears throat> you're going to click yes. Because the examination could be, <clears throat> I went on the internet and I got prescribed some pills. I got okay. a COVID test. I had a physical. It doesn't matter if you've ever had any medical treatment, any kind in the last five years, visiting an emergency room, the answer would be yes. Okay. So 100% of the time, the answer is yes. I have a question. If you have a husband or wife who get a policy together with one monthly payment, years later, they decide to get divorced, do they have to terminate the policy and get a new one? No. The ownership of the policy can be reverted to one individual. You can change it. So if I'm married and I decide to get divorced, but we want to, in the process of the divorce, I still need to keep the insurance policy on her. I may, if she was the one that was paying for it, now I have to, the ownership of the policy would come over to me. Okay. So you do not have to kill that. Uh, all right. Next thing is any medical treatment in the last five years, right? Because 28B falls under 28, which is in the last five years. So I've had any medical treatment including prescription medications. So going back to Heather, Heather, have you had any medical treatment in the last five years? Um, could I say yes for the arthritis? Sure, or... yes, you say whatever okay. you want. Have, have okay. you had it in the last five years? Uh, no. No, okay. So, so far we know yes, but I'm gonna ask, are you taking any medications, right? Because it says includes prescription medications. So Heather, are you taking any medication? Uh, no. Well, Heather I mean, said, 
but Heather, you're going to tell me, yes, I am taking some medication. Okay. Yes. I'm just trying to think of what an arthritis medication could be. We're not on that one yet. We'll come back to that. Oh, okay. This is exactly where you catch somebody about the depression and anxiety medication. Okay. So oh, okay. then you're, hey, are you taking a medication? Oh, yes, I am. Okay. What medication are you taking? I'm taking Zoloft. What are you taking it for? Depression. Anxiety. Okay. So we know the answer is yes here. And for a bit hospitalized, is the answer yes or no? Let's just say no. But I do so know. Would you then, sorry, would you then go back if they said, yeah, I've been taking medication for depression and go back to that question and change it to yes then? Yes, but oh. I will tell you not to do it right away. Okay. Because you don't want to tie the two together, even though they are tied together. Because in either way, you could do it immediately or not. Regardless, you're going to have to come down here to which one? 24B. And you've mm -hmm. got to change that from a no to a yes. And then you put it under her and there's a depression. Okay. Now she may be taking the medication for anxiety, not for depression. But you still need that because look what happens over here. When I click the depression for her, click close, you get the depression questionnaire. And if I double click on it, the first thing it asks, depression, anxiety, or nervous disorder. So that's where you would put that information. Okay. Okay. Now, the reason I tell you not to make the change immediately because they're watching you do this. And if you go and change this right away, they may say, well, I don't have any of that. You following me? Yeah. And now you have to overcome the, not the objection, but now you have to address the fact that you just said basically that they've got a mental disease or disorder, which it is according to the medical uh, community, but we don't necessarily want to make that hit somebody over the head with a slant hammer, right? <clears throat> right. <clears throat> Pardon me. So what I would do is I would just leave it at no for now, knowing I need to come back there because they told me they took Zoloft for anxiety, okay? So let's just keep this in the back of our mind. Yes, Bridget, how can I help you? I just have a question if that's like ever been hospitalized or if there was a certain number of years that they had been hospitalized or within a time frame. So A, B, and C are all tied to question 28 and 28 says, have the proposed insured in the last five years? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nick, how can I help you? Um, okay. So two things. First off, the form that I have uh, number 28 is has any proposed insured ever been rejected for life or medical hospital insurance rated or failed to receive a policy as applied for yeah what state are you in well i'm in arkansas but i'm filling it out as though it's california i've been tracking with you okay so that's a, that's okay I, i'm not sure why it came up that way but sometimes you'll have that question okay uh, are you on a super combo or on a uh, senior combo Super, right? I'm on super, yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll look at that in just a minute. Okay. Okay. Has a proposed insured currently a resident in a nursing home with a diagnosis of having a terminal illness? If the answer to this question is yes, can I sell them insurance? No. And you guys should all know that from your state licensing exam, right? And not sell them insurance if that answer is yes. So we're going to say no. Has proponent insured ever had or been treated for any of the following conditions? 30 goes up to A through H. So asthma, emphysema, sleep apnea, ulcer colitis, or digestive tract, cirrhosis, hepatitis, and liver disorder other than HIV, or I'm sorry, blood disorder other than HIV, received a bone marrow transplant, kidney, prostate, bladder issues, disease of the breast, uterus, and ovaries, rheumatoid arthritis, loss of hearing, and loss of sight. And by that, I mean completely in one eye or one ear. The fact that I wear glasses doesn't mean that I've lost sight completely in one eye or one ear. Okay. And again, if you answer yes to any of these, you're just going to get forced to kind of fill out over here. And then acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS related complex. If you have AIDS, but it's non detectable, what is the answer to this question? Yes. The answer will be yes. Okay. Does not matter if it's no longer detectable. When applying for other insurance, has any proposed ever tested positive to the antibodies to the AIDS virus? And in the last year, has the proposed insured had unplanned weight loss, lymph node enlargement, recurrent diarrhea, fever, or pneumonia? 
why are we asked that question, 32? Why is that necessary for us to know that? Yes, Joanne, what's the answer? I would say they might be looking for any cancer that are full No, like, they're uh, actually, it's uh, COVID. Oh, because <laughs> it sounds so like it was not on the form until three months after COVID hit. And then they started to put this question on there. So basically, it's help, helping us figure out if somebody has a potential issue that puts them at a higher risk due to COVID. Because there's no COVID question on here, right? Okay. So let's say the answer is no. Does the proposed insurer smoke cigarettes or use tobacco in any form? Heather, what's the answer? No. No. And then what I typically say, the million-dollar question, Heather, Got to get this one right. Here we go. Have you used marijuana in the past year? No. So what if you had told me, yes, what do I need to do? Go back and change the uh, non-tobacco user to... Uh, right there. I would take these X's off the non-tobacco user for each one of them if they both use marijuana in the past year. Right? Right. There you go. And I would have to change this to a yes right here, 33. <clears throat> Do you smoke cigarettes or use tobacco in any form? Okay. Yes. Nick, your hand's still up. And Joanne, your hand's up. And Doris, your hand's up. Which one of you has a question? I have a question. Um, yeah. So if they said um, they were a tobacco user and they quit, if they're a former and they say it's in the past year, then you would still mark them as a tobacco user? That's correct. Okay. So if a, if a former used tobacco wanted to propose a quit, if it's over a year ago, you can say they're a non-tobacco user. If it's less than a year ago, they're still considered a tobacco user and you just have to put uh, the person's name and the date that they quit. And the reason for that is... Uh, we consider you a tobacco user for up to one year after you've actually quit. So if you write a policy for somebody today and they quit tobacco six months ago, you can tell them that in six months they're able to contact American Income and we will then rework their rate and lower it to a non-tobacco user. Yes, Jordan Rivera, you got a question or no? Um, yeah, I um, hate to ask a hypothetical, but let's say somebody says that they're not tobacco and they end up dying from lung cancer from tobacco use, uh, could the insurance company refuse to pay out since they improperly marked that on the application? Well, the death certificate will say they died from lung cancer. They won't tell us how the lung cancer was, uh, you know, how it started. Okay. Right? <clears throat> so if somebody says they're a non-tobacco user, we check the records and we find out that uh, they've been to the doctor, they have such and such, they've had to go through treatment for it or whatever, then we're going to pull the trigger on them, right? All right, thank you. Yeah. Renee, what is your question about the state of Pennsylvania? Are you just letting me know your questions are different? Yeah, I'm just letting you know. I'm following, but my questions are completely different. <clears throat> All right, so we've got that. We've got that. Have they used proposed, uh, sorry, in the marijuana last year? We're going to say no, but we know if the answer was yes, we have to change the other things. Now that I've done that, when I come down here, now I'm going to ask the question, okay, I need the name of either your clinic or your hospital that you go to or the name of your doctor. And if they say, and typically this is what they'll tell me, they'll go, oh, it's Dr. So-and-so at, you know, Mayo Clinic, or whatever. They may not know the phone number. And I'm going to say, okay, hold on a second. I can look that up for you. And they'll go, oh, okay. The moment I do that, before I actually look it up, knowing that the answer up here to the medication was yes, and she's taking Zoloft, that's when I then make this change right here, the 24B. I'm just gonna click that, I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna change that to depression for Mary and say close. And then I'm gonna scroll down. I'm gonna do that really quickly, just so now I've got the depression questionnaire up and ready to go when I'm ready to go through all the forms. That's how I do it. Other uplines may do it differently, that's completely fine. Whatever works for you, just know that if they're taking medication for anxiety or for depression, that you need to have that form filled out. Yes, Bob? Would pausing your screen be dishonest then? 
No, you can pause your screen if that's how you want to do it. That's fine. Okay, so now we're here. Now I need to fill this out, right? And it's going to be Dr. X at the Mayo Clinic. And I'm going to put in a phone number, right? So I'm just going to put in the 555-555-55. And I'm going to say that I saw this person last year in January, so 2022, right? I'm going to leave the medical records ID blank. I'm going to fill it in later, but it's going to be blank because what I'm going to put in here is their social security number. It just makes it easier. I don't have to get a separate number and they don't have to figure anything out. I'm going to get that later. And then in this particular case, I'm just going to use uh, the same person again. However, um, a lot of times men and women have different doctors, right? Or they may go to different clinics, whatever the case may be. Go ahead and get the appropriate information for uh, each one of the people that you're going to cover. Okay. So I'm going to say that they actually was saw in June of last year. Skip this one. And now <clears throat> I need to put in the city. That's the next thing. Remember where I wrote this? I wrote this in San Jose, California. So here I'm going to put in the city of San Jose. Okay. Then the agency statement. I certify that I have asked all questions and truly and accurately reported the information supplied by the applicant to the best of my knowledge and belief, the life insurance applied for is or is not intended to replace any insurance now in effect. Jade Lorenz, 100% of the time, what should I click? Is not. Exactly. I love it. When a plan comes together, 100% of the time, I only have two additional things I need to fill in here. I need to put the best time to call, which can be 8 to 12, 12 to 6, 6 to 9, or all day, 8 to 9. And then I'm going to mail the policy to, who am I mailing the policy to? Am I mailing it to the agency or am I mailing it to the policy holder? Policy holder. Exactly. 100% of the time. In the old days, we used to mail it to the agency and then we would make a visit to the policy holder and deliver the policy to them. Since that's not reasonable anymore for us to do that, we are mailing it directly to the policy holder. Sandra Taylor, how long does it take for a policy to get to the applicant once that's been submitted eight weeks sandra was that you that was pretty impressive did you throw your voice <laughs> but yeah it's six to eight weeks okay six to eight weeks okay and i received many calls from people going hey i haven't received my policy information yet I'm like okay it'll get to you but I'm going to show you something that we do that will help these clients feel like they've got something tangible, okay? So now all that information is filled out. I'm not going to put anything in the remarks yet. I'll talk about that later. Typically, you don't have to. Medical information is done. Everything is done. <clears throat> now I have all these forms over here I need to fill out, okay? So the A71 <clears throat> is a disclaimer. It basically gives them the information about the A71 that they're purchasing from us. Okay, and notice here that an adult, 30,000, 15,000, but for the child, it's only six and three. Children on the A71 do not have the same payout for the accidental death as an adult does. All right, and you see that when you uh, show HB Pro and you're going through the plan, uh, the benefit summary. Okay, alcohol exclusion. So we said we use alcohol, so it's gonna say, Supplement attached to and forming part of the application taken from John Doe, the insurer. So I don't have to do anything, but what is it saying? It's understood and agree that no payment will be made under my policy on account of disability or loss resulting directly or indirectly, wholly or in part, from driving any motor vehicle while intoxicated or under the influence of alcohol as determined by the legal standard of the jurisdiction in which the loss occurs. So we're basically saying we're not going to pay you out if, in fact, you get in a car accident and you've been drinking. All right. Well, you have to actually be driving the vehicle. So it's an exclusion. <clears throat> then we have an exclusion rider that we also have to fill out. Again, same thing, same information, just in a different way. Okay. And then each state may have a different way that we say it, but there you go. Then we talk about alcohol use questionnaire. Okay. How often do you drink? So have you ever been charged uh, with a DUI? No. If yes, how many years? What's your driver's license number? We got to fill all this stuff out. If you no longer drink, when was your last date? And then how often do you drink every day, one to two times a week, one to two times a month, or less than above? So you have to fill in all the information in blue if you answer the alcohol question and this form comes up. 
Arthritis questionnaire. <clears throat> Pardon me. So is it osteo, is it rheumatoid, or is it degenerative? And then does it interfere with your daily activities? Non-severe, slight, disabled, which joints are affected? Are you taking medication, dosage, name, and address of the doctor? All of this has to be filled out. Then you have the aviation questionnaire, because we said we plan to be on an airplane as other than a passenger in the last two years or in the future. Okay, what type of flying do you do? And then type certificates that are held. Do you have an instrument flight rating? And then when it was issued, the type of aircraft that you typically fly, total number of solo hours, all of that to try to figure out what is your risk profile. Yes, Ronak. Um, so when you fill all this stuff out, is there a need to save it in any way? Or as soon as you nope. hit X, it's saved? Nope. Once you sit X, uh, so let's say I say it's business, right? So it's an X and I close it. If I open it back up, hopefully the X is still there. Yep, it's right there. So it saves it automatically. Yeah, you don't have to do anything else to it. So you fill all this out and now that one's done. And now we come to the depression questionnaire. So have you ever had or been treated for any type of depression, anxiety, or nervous disorder? So remember, she's taking Zoloft for anxiety. So the question, the answer is going to be yes. You need to give me the date of the diagnosis. Do you currently take medication? Yes, I do. I take Zoloft, right? And uh, my dosage is uh, 500 milligrams because I've got a lot of issues. <laughs> and I'm going to say four times a day. So basically I'm drugged out completely, right? So I got to put that in there. If I'm taking any other medication for depression, anxiety, or nervous disorder, I need to list it. Was I ever hospitalized? Did I have to stay in the hospital overnight? How many days? What's the address? Did I miss time from work? Or am I disabled due to it? And then who is the physician that's treating me? And oh, by the way, have you ever received treatment from a psychologist or psychiatrist? Uh, psychiatrist. A psychiatrist, right? Because what? We're trying to understand your risk envelope. The more you put in here that's accurate, the better it's going to be. However, your risk envelope may shrink in terms of what we're willing to do with you. Make sense? Oh, my gosh. Doris Stokes. Who is that? Who is? Oh, my God. How cute. Who is that? Uh, this needs a bath. <laughs> but this is Darla. <laughs> Darla. So cute. I had to give her an old lady name like mine. So we match. There you go. Zuri, how can I help you? Um, yeah, kind of like the um, kid question, which, you know, that's a lot of kids. Um, if there's someone who has more than three medications for any of those conditions, like say they have all three and they have like five medications, mm -hmm. would you do the same thing? Would you go out and create another app just to add an additional so, application? What I would do is I'd say Zoloft and I would say blah, blah, blah. And I would say blah, blah, blah. That would be three on there. And then I would put a dash here and say how much, how much, and then another dash. And then they would know Zoloft at 500 milligrams, this thing at this thing, and this thing at that thing. Okay. So I can three, six, nine, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So now we've done all that. All that looks good. So we know in this case, it was only going to be a huge dose of Zoloft. Okay. So we're going to go and get rid of all that. Uh, Joanne Mackey, what can I do for you? Do they sign these? like do we put in their name or do they have a chance to electronically sign these oh yeah we don't have to put their name in they're gonna sign every one of these things okay at the end you know she was just proposed and sure signature down at the bottom uh-huh we actually send this thing off to the client they oh, will okay. get docusign and it will have all the places that they need to sign got it bob johnson how can i help you so in real life, if you saw that huge dose of Zoloft, would you try all this? Uh, no, I'm not making a decision about how much they're taking or what they're taking. It's not up to me, nor should it be up to any of you, right? Because we don't know what that means. We may have an idea. We're like, oh my God, it seems like a lot. But reality, we're not doctors. And so we have no idea if that's an appropriate dosage or not. What will happen is underwriting will get that and then compare it against the actual doctor records, and they're the ones that will assess whether or not it's something that needs to be uh, addressed. Is that fair, Bob? So, Joanne, we got you done. Harpreet, what can I do for you? Uh, what is the button on top where it says validate? What happens when you press that? I'm not there yet. We <laughs> will get there. All right, my bad. No, no, it's okay. We will definitely get there. 
So I filled all this stuff out as best I can, okay? So now, close that one. I got one left. It's the medical information form. When I open that thing up, it shows me just Mary because there was nothing about John. Everything that I put about Mary and in the other forms, any medication or anything that's going on, I need to replicate it in this form. Why is that? When I look at the depression questionnaire and I fill this out, I'm doing it on behalf of Mary, where do I sign this form? I do not. Right? I don't put my name on this form at all. It's coming from Mary. But where I do put my name, and I'm sorry, where I do sign is on this form right there. Okay? The other thing is, is that this form, if you're just taking generic medication, nothing in particular, you're going to put it in here. This goes to one group of the underwriters that are just handling the day-to-day -day stuff, okay? For lack of a better phrase. If I have a depression drug that I'm taking, I have a separate uh, depression questionnaire that opens up over here. That may go to another group of underwriters who's totally focused on nothing but depression-related issues. Does that make sense? So just think about it, like uh, um, you can send in your job application and the, the admin for HR will look at it and just fill it in. And if nothing pops up, then she doesn't address it. However, if you put something in that job application that the hiring manager needs to know about it, then it will get kicked to the hiring manager. So it just depends who's going to look at it at what time, okay? But the biggest thing is you're not signing any of the others. You're going to sign this one right here. Okay, so you're going to fill all this out with the Zoloft information about the depression. If they had a child or they were pregnant and they was born within the last two years, you're going to put that in there whether or not they stayed in the hospital, right? Anything that happened within, I'm oh, sorry, the five years, anything that happened within five years, you're going to put in here that they tell you about, okay? Then when all of that is done, we have filled out all the forms that we know about over here. We say, hey, looks like we're almost done. We got all those forms filled out. That's great. Now, the only thing that's left for me to do is I need to get your social security number, your driver's license, and your banking information. And remember, this should only take five or 10 minutes at the most, depending on what their medical condition is and what drugs you're taking. Okay? If you spend five minutes and then you ask for this, in my opinion, more likely than not, they're going to give you what you're asking for because they can see that it's necessary. So now I'm going to put in the social security number, right? And so in California, we're just going to say it's 547-251111. And for her, we're going to say 547-252222. Driver's license number in California is a letter. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 6, 5, 4, 5. And C, 1, 2, 3, 6, 5, 4, 6. And that's in California. Okay. If you attempt to enter a social security number that's not valid, it's going to get kicked back. If you attempt to enter a, li a driver's license that isn't in the format that the state you said the driver's license was in, it will get kicked back. The system knows what type of numbers should be in there. So now you've got the driver's license and you've got the social security numbers. The only thing left to fill out is the banking information. Okay, So this is what I want you to do when you're ready to get the banking information. You're going to go and you're going to say, okay, who do you bank with? And you're going to, can you guys see this other screen up here? You got, do you see my screen here? Yeah, I can. Okay. So Google. So we're going to say Bank of America. Okay. So you're going to, okay, so Bank of America, what city do you bank in or where did you get the uh, bank account opened at? Because if you're a Bank of America, Bank of America has multiple uh, routing numbers or what's known as ABA numbers because they've acquired a lot of banks over time and they don't necessarily change the routing number based on the bank. They just assume that routing number. So there's three or four routing numbers for the state of California for Bank of America. With other financial institutions, there, be, there may be one routing number for a state or there may be just one routing number for the entire United States. Regardless, you need to come up with what that is. So let's say it's Bank of America and it's in uh, San Jose, California. 
and I'm going to type in routing number. Okay. And I'm going to click that. So here, uh, sorry, scroll down here. I'm going to type in Bank of America. Whoops. Okay. And the city we know is San Jose, and the state is going to be California. Then it's going to ask for the routing number or the AVA number. I can look this up here and know that the routing number can be a number of different numbers. It just depends. So I will tell them, hey, the routing number that I have for the Bank of America in California is 12100358. Is that what you have? You're building credibility if you're able to give them information as opposed to them giving you everything. Remember, it's all about give and take. So if I'm giving them that number, they're going to be, oh, okay, you kind of know what you're doing. All right, so then I'm going to type in 12100358. The other thing that I'm going to do when I have this up is I'm going to come up with this, and you need to do this 100% of the time whenever you take an application. All right, you're going to come here and you're going to log into uh, Planet Alting. When you log into Planet Alting, you're going to come down to virtual sales right here and you're going to click on this and all of you should be doing this right now and what you're going to do is scroll down until you get to bank account verification you're going to click on blank bank account verification you should bookmark this site because i want you to do this 100 percent of the time the number one problem that we ever had with applications was incorrect banking information. So you're going to put in here the routing number, 12100358. Then you're going to ask, what is the account number? And they're going to say it's 123456. Notice over here, we need to add the account number in. But when I first put the banking routing number in and I hit tab, it asked me to enter the text again and it got rid of it because we know the number one problem is banking information. So we need to enter that in again. One, two, one, zero, 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 three, five, seven. If I type it in that way and I hit enter, it's going to tell me the values don't match. The values don't match between the number I entered secondarily as opposed to what I initially entered. So I'm going to click OK, and I know the number is 358. When I click OK, they match and allows me to go to the next field. In this field, it's 123456. <clears throat> I'm just giving it a fake uh, account number. I hit tab. I enter it again, and I entered it equally, and it will come through just fine. What you're doing here is the same thing. You're going to enter in the amount. Let's say it's 150. Well, how much was the amount? It's 146, so I'm going to put about $150. What this is going to do is it's going to go and check to make sure that one, the routing number is accurate and that the account number exists with this person's name on here, John Doe, and you need to put in their email address, right? An email that I use with john at gmail.com. Now we know all of this is bogus. So when I click on verify, this is what happens. It says the bank account is not verified or it's an unex un unaccepted account site. Please collect a different method of payment from the client. This tool is tied to all of the top banking institutions. So we have a contract with all of them that we were able to use this tool, send out a kind of request to let us know, hey, is this person have an account at this bank with this account number? If the answer is yes, we're checking to see if it has at least the amount of money we expect to draw out of that account. If it comes back with a green check mark, then you're perfectly fine. If it comes back this way, then there's a problem. Either there's not enough money in the account or more than likely the routing number and the account number do not match or it's not under John's name. We want you to fix this first using this tool to verify with the client what is the account number so when you put it through eApp, it will actually go through. And like I said, that was the number one reason why most applications never went through is because the banking numbers are incorrect. Okay, Harpreet, your hand is up. How can I help you? Uh, nothing. Sorry, I got <clears throat> just didn't. Oh. All right, Sharde, what can I do for you? Um, so I don't have this page. I went to virtual sales and then the 
you know, verification. And then it took me back to my homepage. Can you type in uh, Planet Altix slash account slash bank verification into the uh, address bar up here? And will it still take you back to Planet Altix? Because if it's doing that, it means that you don't have, I think, a uh, an agent number has not been activated for you yet. Because what happens whenever you submit this, it we track how many times the agent is asking for the information. Because then we have to pay, I believe, based on usage. So that could be the case is that it's not working for you yet because you're not an active agent yet. Heather Michaels, what can I do for you? Um, that was what was going on with mine also. Uh, okay. so I haven't tried the, doing the slash bank. Okay. But anyways, um, so for the inquiry, uh, if it's under Mary's name, I would just put Mary's Mary Doe, right? If, if the account is under her name. Yeah. If she's oh. the account holder, yes. Okay. Bridget Corgill, how can I help you? Where are you getting that amount? Can you go back to that? Is that just like the monthly payment or is that the annual payment or is it's that just here MBD 146.28? I just rounded it up to 150. Okay. Are you supposed to round up or is it won't make any difference? What you're checking is to make sure there's enough money in the account so that if you do a draw, it will actually work. Okay. So if uh, John has 150, then certainly I'll be able to take out 146. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So let's say that it actually showed up here in green. Everything is fine. I'm good to go. Uh, and the client doesn't need to see this, by the way. You don't need to show the client that you're doing a bank verification check because it doesn't do anything to them. It's not costing them any money. It's not a check on their credit, nothing like that. Okay. You're just verifying that all the information you got was correct. So if it's correct here and give you a green check mark, that means it's good here. Then we have to put in checking or savings. Now, remember in the beginning, an HP Pro at the needs analysis screen, we asked, do you have a check? I'm assuming you have a checking savings account, right? Or we asked that in the financial information guide and the family information guide, right? But we didn't, we don't care about what you have specifically at that point. Now we do. Is it a checking or is it a savings account? So more often it's going to be a checking account. All right. Now the next thing is what about the requested draw date? So this is a important thing so that we don't cause problems with the client. <clears throat> so what I want everybody to do is open up their uh, new agent packet. So I'm trying to find mine. Uh, new agent packet. Okay, boom. So I'm gonna bring that up in just a second. Come on, here we go, new agent packet. It's gonna be right here. So there's the new agent packet, right? And I'm just gonna hide the toolbar and I'm going to zoom to height. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you have here on page 46, bank draft dates. So if I, today is what, the 18th? If I have an application that I'm writing today on the 18th, and I turn around and say that the uh, date that I want to draft out for every month after that is going to be the 28th, am I going to have an issue? Tara, Magnum, Mangum. No, okay. you're, you're good. I'm good. If today was the first, and I said that my annual or my monthly draft date was gonna be on the 27th, would I have an issue? Yes. The, and do you know why? Because it has to be within two weeks of the application date for the <clears> first draw. So here's, yeah. So conceptually, here's what happens. So we're all looking at my screen, right? Let's say today was the first. If I submit it today and they pull the money out on the first, 
And the very next time they're going to pull the money out is on the 20, uh, what I say, the 27th. That means within 30 days, I will have hit that bank account two times. Mm -hmm. Everyone following me? So if I look at the application right here, if I say the requested draw date is going to be, let's say the first, and I hit tab, it's going to tell me that based on your monthly draft date, you'll be drafted on March 1st, right? Which is greater than 30 days from today. However, if I put a different date on there, let's say, what, the 26th? Now it's going to tell me that you'll be drafted on February 26th. Am I still okay? Is that over 30 days? It's yes, over right. 30 days. Right. So if I put a different number in here, or I'm sorry, not a different number, but a different date, I could cause problems where I end up drawing from the client's bank account the money more, uh, I'm sorry, I'll draw money out twice within 30 days. Is that a problem, T. Dozier? Yes. And why is that a problem? Uh, I mean, you don't want to charge them more than once. Okay, so let's say I'm your, well, you're my client, and I fill this thing out, and I say, okay, I'm going to put the date of uh, 21. It says, based on the annual draft date, you will be drafted on January 21st. Well, today is the 18th. That means I'm going to hit it twice, right? Yes. Wow, that's really bizarre. Is this that's... 2024, right? Or yeah, I'm I know. not I crazy? Just... That, no, that's that's not right. That's not the way that it's supposed to work. That's really strange. Um, yeah, that is really bizarre. It's probably because we're in a training mode. You left it. You left it under annual draft instead of monthly. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much. So monthly draft. That's going to change everything. It's got to play catch up. Yeah. All right. So the whole point here, and I've seen this happen to agents. What they'll do is they'll put in a date and they know the money's going to be taken out theoretically tomorrow, but more than likely at least two days. So if you write an application today, we'll probably pull the money out of your account on Friday. Okay. If I don't put the requested draw date in correctly, I'm sorry, if I don't put it in, if I don't do it correctly, then what ends up happening is I'm going to hit your account one more time before 30 days, which isn't the end of the world, except Let's say it cost 150 bucks, okay, T? And now I'm going to hit your account twice. So now I've just charged you $300. You're going to call me up, I'm guessing, and you're going to say, hey, Sam, you took money out of my account twice. I'm going to go, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. What is the very next thing you're going to tell me? Um, is it going to be like this every month or can I get my money back? Bingo. I want to get my money back because it's only supposed to happen once a month, right? Right. What am I going to say? I'm going to say, well, unfortunately, no, I can't give you a refund. Because that's true. I can't give you a refund, right? Because whatever was in the application is how it's going to be processed by home office, not by us, but by home office. So if I put it in correctly, you're going to get hit twice with one one month you're going to ask for a refund. And if I tell you, I'm sorry, T, I can't give you a refund, what will you cancel. more? <laughs> Bingo. You're going to cancel because you're like, ah, you guys don't have your act together. It doesn't work. You're going to cancel. Okay. So if I sold an application on the 1st and I put a draw date of the 21st, that's outside the window of the 2nd to the 15th, which means the money will come out on the 1st and the money will come out again on the 21st. So what this tool or this page is designed to do is tell you, hey, you only want it to be 14 days from the day that you submit the application. So don't tell them they can pick any date of the month. Tell them you can only pick, if you sold it on the 1st, from the 2nd to the 15th. Today is the 18th. So if I go down to the 18th, I can only do from the seventh, sorry, from the 19th to the 1st. I don't want to put any other date than that. So don't give them the option to put any other date than that. Now, if they tell you, and I'll get right with you, Tara. If they tell you, well, Sam, I really need to have a come out on the, uh, 
on the 14th, 13th or whatever that you know is going to cause it to come out twice, say, hey, you know what? We're going to do it the first time so I don't charge you twice within 30 days. And then you can give me a call and I can then fix it for you after that first payment comes out. Because we can change the dates after the fact, right? But the initial application, when it goes through, you want to make sure that you stay within that 14-day window. Yes, Tara, how can I help you? You basically just answered my question. Oh, I love that. That is awesome. All right, let me see. I have a is question. I'm sorry. No, never apologize. What's your question? So you wouldn't like hold applications or when would you hold an application? <clears throat> so let me get to the very end of this and then I'll talk about that, okay? Because <clears throat> more often than not, I do not want you to hold an application. And well, so let me talk about now, yeah. Do I want you to hold an application? If you sold an application today or you fill out an application and sold a deal and you decided to hold it, <clears throat> where are you holding it at? You're holding it on your computer, right? Your computer, not in the cloud. It hasn't been uplisted. That being the case, home office does not know that you're holding an application, okay? So that's fact number one. Fact number two, if you were gonna submit it as standard, Tamika, at what point does that person have coverage? At that so, moment is submitted when they at pay. The moment that they, in their mind, at the moment they sign, correct? Correct. Yeah. So if they sign the application and they think they have coverage, you have held it, so you haven't put it up into the cloud. <clears throat> Has consideration been given yet? No. You don't have a contract, correct? Right. So if you don't have a contract, <clears throat> then AIL definitely is not going to pay out if somebody were to die before you uploaded it. <clears throat> but could that family sue you? Absolutely. Right. That family could sue you. Now, whether they prevail or not, <clears throat> pardon me, a little cough. Will they prevail or not? Who knows? But the point there is AIL won't be a party to the lawsuit because they never got the application from you. So we need to consider that. Okay. There are times where you're going to want to hold a policy, but you have to keep in mind there's reasons why you want to hold it. Let's say somebody that I'm talking to tonight tells me, hey, Sam, I got all that, but I don't get paid till Friday right? They don't have the money in their account. They'll have it on Friday. Do I want to go ahead and finish out the application? Yes. I don't want to call them back up on Friday and then try to get them back on the phone or back on Zoom and do it. I want to close them right now. So what I'll tell them is, hey, we're going to finish all this out. I'll hold the application until Friday. <clears throat> and then Friday, I'll submit it. In the meantime, you're going to sign in everything. You're going to do all that. But trust me, I am not going to submit it to home office until Friday when you have money in the account. However, be aware that because I'm holding it, you don't have coverage with us until I actually submit it on Friday. So that's when you would want to hold an application when you've made it perfectly clear to the client that they don't have coverage until you actually submit it to the home office. Does that make sense, Tamika? Yes. Okay. Tara, you have another question? Yes, at the bottom of the application, it says, please attach avoided personal check because I'm in Texas. How do you grab that from them? Well, you don't. It, you don't need that. That's if you're in person. Every one of the uh, applications, regardless of the state, has that. See, mine in California, please attach avoided personal check. You don't need that anymore. Okay. You do that in the old days when you were in person. Okay. All right. I thought mine was special because of Texas. Nope. You're not special. Okay, so we'll say that that's going to be the 4th. That'll change our date. And now we know it's going to be March 4th. That's outside 30 days. We're completely fine. So now we're completely covered. We've now filled out page one in its entirety, and we filled out page two in its entirety. And we believe that we fill out all this information over here. Uh, Steph, pardon me, Stephanie Flynn, what do you got for me? I'm, I'm sorry, I got very confused. So if we hold, we, we still have to hold it to Friday if we make that date. So we still have to hold, we would have to hold it until Friday if Friday is the date that it's coming out or if 
or 14 days from Friday is the date that it needs to come no, out. No, no, no. Yeah, you are. Yeah. So you're writing an application. I gave you an example where I, if I wrote one tonight and the client tells me that I don't have any money in my account till this Friday, I still want to close the deal, but I will tell them that I'm just going to hold submitting the application to home office until Friday. Normally, I'm going to process everything as soon as I get it. Right. I'm going to tell people, hey, you're going to have the first thing taken out in, you know, 48 hours. Uh, everything else is good to go. I'm going to go ahead and submit it done and dusted. And then I'm going to upload it as soon as I'm done with that client. I'm going to upload it into the uh, cloud or to home office. The whole reason I was giving you an example of where you might want to hold it is because Tamika was asking me, what do I do if it needs to be held? What does that mean? And that's why I gave you that example. But we could just make it that the money comes out on Friday and then we wouldn't have to hold it, right? No, because when you be within that 14 days? the money, the first payment will come out within 48 hours. Okay, you got it. Kelly McDaniel, how can I help you? So on that note, you're telling them that uh, you won't draft it out out to them and you don't have coverage, right? Could we, in the email that we're sending them, basically leave a paper trail stating that we advise them of that, that they would not have coverage starting today? No. To cover why would ourselves? You? No. If they you, come back and said, oh, she didn't no, tell me that. No, because you're not submitting it. Again, <clears throat> more often than not, you're going to submit it immediately. Tomiko asked me if you were to hold it, what would happen? I gave you an example of where you would want to hold it pursuant to what the request was from okay. the client. So you just tell the client, yes, I want to hold it to Friday because that's when you have the money. The reason I'm doing that is because I want to make sure that I'm done and I have a sale. I'm just waiting until Friday to upload it. That's all I'm doing. Normally, I'm going to upload it immediately and clients are aware that I'm doing that. Okay. If we charge you today, the next premium won't be due until the 1st of March, so six weeks apart instead of charging now and then again in 30 days. Yeah, I'm let, Doris, I'm less worried about 30 days than I'm worried about two weeks. The biggest thing, I will tell you, it's happened to me where I didn't understand this in the very beginning. And I sold somebody and I put the wrong date. So they called me up and they said, hey, I need to get a refund. You charged me twice. And I didn't know any better. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll get that for you. So I call home office like, yeah, we don't do refunds. I'm like, okay. So I call the client back. I say, unfortunately, we can't do a refund. The client says, okay, well, then I'm going to cancel. So what do you think I did in that scenario that actually happened, Doris? What do you think I did with that client? You paid you paid it or you paid them back or something. I sent them a Zelle and I paid them the money because I'd much rather lose one month of, of uh, revenue or one month of their uh, premium than have them cancel and lose all 12 and you're an independent contractor 1099, you can absolutely do that. If you're a high net worth individual and you go and buy insurance, and I'm talking high net worths, you're buying three, $5 million worth of coverage, and you walk in there and you sit down with them, they'll probably waive up to the first year in premium fees. Literally, because for them, it makes more sense to do that and pay that on their part and get you for the entire amount because they make a lot of money off you. Yes, Bridget, how can I help you? Sorry, my mute wouldn't work. Um, can you explain how the two weeks um, thing works again? I'm just a little confused. So when you submit down here on page, sorry, page one, down at the bottom, it's asking you, what is the requested draw date? Mm -hmm. If you pick a date that is what I'll call incorrect for lack of a better phrase, right down here. Right. If you pick a wrong date, you can end up where somebody has money taken out of their account twice within 30 days. Because if I change this, let's say to the 17th and I hit tab, this tells me that the account will be drafted on February 17th in addition to whatever I'm doing today. Right. This will always come up and tell me when am I going to get the next draft out? Not the initial one, the next one, the second one. So if I put a different date in here, what did I say? The fourth and I hit tab, 
then it's telling me that's going to be taken out on March 4th. Okay, that's still okay. I know it's I'm much longer than 30 days, but if I put a different date on here, uh, the 11th, now it's coming out on February 11th, which is less than 30 days from today. Right. So a client is going to see that the money gets taken out. In this case, what are we taking out? A hundred and four hundred and forty-six dollars and $0.28. And now they're going to get another $141.28 taken out within 30 days. They're going to say, hey, it should only be once every 30 days, correct? So I need a refund. If you don't pay them that money, since American Income Life is not going to refund them, they will probably cancel. Does that make sense? Sort of. So when I'm looking at the paper of like the first date to the last bank draft, it has to be like between those dates? Yes, because if you say that today is the 7th, today is the 18th, that means if I have a bank draft from the 19th through the 1st, I'm going to be okay. It won't be taken out again. But if I pick a different draft date, it will be taken out within 30 days. So just start with the day one on the first day of the month. If I were to take out on the first day, and if I said my bank draft date was going to be the 18th, that means it doesn't fall in this window. They'll take the same amount of money out again on the 18th. So that means within 30 days, I've hit your account twice. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. So we got that part done. We've now gone through the banking information. So we know how all the banking information works. We're almost home free. We're almost, well, not really, but we're very close. Okay. All of this is filled out. The very next thing that you're going to do, and I forget, was it Harpreet that asked this? You're going to click on validate. And you're going to click on validate because you want to know, did I fill everything out that I was supposed to fill out? So once you click on validate, all this stuff over here is going to be looked at every single field on the application itself is going to be looked at, and it will come back and tell you if there's any errors. Now, it will not tell you if the information you entered in was incorrect. All it's doing is it's telling you whether or not it has information in the fields it's expecting to have. So when I did this, guess what? I've got four errors, right? First one is the driver's license number doesn't match for the state of California. Okay, so I got two errors right there. And if I go down here at the bottom, you can see the errors. Medicare eligibility must be answered and over 65 must be answered. So I can come down here and go, okay, I should have said no. And I should have said no because they're under the age of 65 and they're not eligible for Medicare. So no and no, right? Because they're 39, 38 respectively. And then the driver's license number was incorrect for the state, okay? So C, triple three, seven, one, seven, four. Oh, too many digits. That's what it was. Okay. If I hit validate again, now I should have no errors that will show up on this page. Let's just make sure that's correct. And the answer is sometimes uh, EAP is very slow in terms of getting through everything. So when I hit validate, it's checking not just this one form, it's checking all these over here on the right. There are no errors on this page. So that means I've entered in all the information. I'll be right with you, T. The other thing that it's done is it's given me all of these forms over here. So we're gonna go through each one. Yes, T, how can I help you? Sorry, you can finish um, with this. I just had a question about adding a child on here if it's like a single parent with a child sure okay i'll get to that in a second all right um move that over there all right so now i have all these forms i have accelerated death benefit so when i click on that basically uh it's going to be signed by me it's going to be signed by them and it shows them what the accelerated death benefit would be based on what was put together so i need to look at it every single one of these that pops up i need to open in view and the way that it knows that i did it is it has these little glasses right here okay so I'm going to open up each one of these and check to see if there's anything I need to do here. I don't need to do anything. I already did the accident, the alcohol, and now I'm at the electronic application disclosure. I'm going to look at that. It's going to be signed by the applicant, not by me. So I don't need to do anything. HIPAA. In the HIPAA, this is where we get you, right? 
And if you notice, it says, I authorize any health plan, physician, healthcare, professional, hospital, clinic, laboratory, pharmacy, pharmacy, benefit manager, medical facility, other insurance company, consumer reporting agency, medical information bureau, or other healthcare provider that has provided payment, treatment, or services to me on my behalf to disclose my entire medical record. That's where we get you. You have to sign this in order for this application to go through it. When I say you, I mean the applicant. Okay? There it is right there. They got to put their name in there and sign it. So that allows us to get every little bit of information about you that we possibly can get. Yes, Stephanie. Do we read that or is that their responsibility to read Absolutely. whenever they get? No, nope, it's their responsibility. Thank you. Then there's the HIPAA we talked about. There's the HIV consent. I do this in California. So the reason that this pops up is because if the results, if we have to take a blood sample for whatever reason, as part of a physical or whatever, the results of that, I'm sorry, the blood panel will be screened for, among other things, HIV. If the test result comes back positive, legally, I can't just call you up and say, hey, you tested positive for HIV. You have to actually have a uh, interview with a doctor who can then give you all the information about treatment, things of that nature. So we then ask the applicant for, give us the name of your doctor and we tell you, if your test results are negative, no issues. If they're reported by the laboratory to the insurers being positive, you're entitled to receive that information you so desire, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't come from us, it doesn't come from American Income. We will send the information to the doctor they list here and that doctor will contact them and give them the information directly. Yes, Dora Stokes, how can I help you? Mine still has an error, um, and it's stating that the base plan chosen for spouse contradicts the tobacco use medical question. Yeah, that's because your NTU right here, if you see on my screen, doesn't match the answer that you put on the medical page on page two. Okay. okay? And if Got it's it. still a problem, you can let me know, and I'll look at it. Oral specimen will come up for all of your applications. This is not necessary because we're no longer doing this in person. In the old days, when we used to sit in a home, we actually carried with us oral specimen kits, and we'd have to put the number of the kit, and then we'd have to take the thing out and swab the inside of their cheek. What were we checking for, Heather Michaels? Heather Michaels, what were we checking for? Zuri Reed, what were we checking for? Sorry, um, <laughs> checking for tobacco use. Exactly, nicotine, right? Because it lasts in the body for a year. Okay, so we have that done. We know we uh, put NA here for non applicable because we no longer have to do that. And we are going to click on payer information. Notice each one of these forms, as our breed asks, is has validate up here. If I had to fill out a form with information, I can click validate and it will check to see if there's any errors on this page. If there's no errors, I get this issue. If there's something incorrect, like not filled out, then it would tell me there's an error and I can fix it. Yes, Bridget Corville, how can I help you? Are we just putting NA on the oral specimens like 100% of the time just because we don't do them? Yes. Okay. We no longer take an oral specimen because we're not in the home. The next thing that comes up is the replacement form. And basically this is saying document must be signed by the applicant and the agents. And it says, I do or do not have existing life, individual life insurance policies or annuity contracts. 100% of the time, Ronick Patel, what do I put? Is it do or do not have existing individual life insurance policies or annuity contracts? Uh, do not. Do not. That's correct. We're not replacing anything. That's basically asking us, if you're going to replace something, then you need to let us know what it is you're attempting to replace. All of you that have gotten your license and are actually gone through your state-mandated training, when we talk about replacement, it gets very touchy about what we can and can't do, correct? So American Income Life, we do not do that at all. We are complimentary. We are not in the market. Sorry, we're not in the business of marketing ourselves as a replacement, okay? So I do not. You need to click that 100% of the time and then close. Then we have two of them because it's also for the wife. I do not. And then I close that. And then secondary address C, the last one that comes up. First name, last name of uh, who it is. That in this case, I'm going to call it uh, Frank Smith. This is the person that we would contact in the event. Uh, uh, can't, I'm sorry, premiums that have not shown up. 
more often than not, I don't tell them that. What I say is, hey, this is an additional addressee. If for some reason we can't get a hold of you and there's an emergency or we haven't received payment, something like that, we would just reach out to this person to see if we can get to you. And yes, you're still screen sharing this entire time. Okay. So I'm going to put this in here. I'm going to say it's in San Jose and California. And 511. And phone number is going to be 408-555-1212. Okay. So now we did all that. If I wanted to validate, just check to make sure I enter the information correctly. It says there are no errors. Again, it doesn't know that that's not a real address. It just knows the field that's been populated. So click OK. I've done that. Everything is now good to go. I believe it's completely done. I want to run validate one more time just to go through all of that, just to make sure that I did not miss anything or accidentally change something that will result in an error. So it's going to go through this entire thing and it's going to tell me, did I do this correct? And it's going to chug along and it's going to do that. Okay. No errors on this form right here. All right. Now I'm going to pause for just a second and I'm going to bring up the senior combo because I want to walk through that one with you. All this stuff over here. We'll st if it comes up, you handle it exactly the same way on the senior life combo as you would on the super combo, okay? On the senior combo, it looks like this, which is going to be a little bit different from the super combo. And we're going to point out what those differences are side by side. So again, at the top right, you're still going to put veteran and then click on an X in the empty box, put veteran, or if it's a referral, you put veteran and then referral. If you're in the credit union market, you're going to put CU as the credit union, and then in the affiliation name, you're going to put the name of the credit union they belong to. You're going to put the name of the insured. If you notice, there are no children spots available on the senior combo. It can only be the husband and the wife, Okay. You're still going to say, I saw date of birth, the age, the birthplace, height, weight, sex, NTU, and their social security number. You're going to tell me who owns it, whether it's proposed A or someone else. If it, on either one of these, if it's not proposed A and it's somebody else, you need to put their last name, first name, the relationship, and the social security number. And why do I need to know the relationship? Doris Stokes? Insurable interest. Exactly. As we know from our state mandated training, in order to get insurance on somebody, you have to have insurable interest. Then you put in the address of the policy, right? And then you're going to complete B if it's separate life insurance policies, primary and contingent, just like here, primary and contingent, right? Then I drop down here. I have occupation and duties, just like I had up here, driver's license, phone number, email address. Okay, everything's going exactly the same so far. Then I come down here, is the insurance intended to replace or change any insurance? We know the answer is always going to be no. So that means we don't need to fill out this section over here. And then is the proposal U.S. citizen, yes or no? And then here, I'm going to put in the face amount. Now, I can't do it because I didn't put the name up here. But if I did and put all that information, I would then be able to add the amount. What is a maximum amount that I can provide on somebody, Bob Johnson, who's 60 or older? Uh, 35,000. 34,999. So for all intents and purposes, 35,000. Yes. Uh, keep in mind that it's graded whole life. So year one, year two, year three, it's 25, 50, and 75% payout respectively. Okay. Do we wish to uh, add automatic premium loan provision on any of your life insurance policies, 100% of the time, Chardet, it should be? No. Or yes, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> You're trying to mess with me. Okay, <laughs> accident insurance policy. Over here on the A71, it looked like this. Over here, it looks very similar, but here is the difference. You can do individual or family, depending upon how you sold it and if you have two names up there. You're not going to do any kids with this one. And you can do an optional recuperation rider in some states, but only from ages of 60 to 64. In other states, you can't do it at all. And in some states, you can do it after the age of 60. It just depends on what state that you're in. You do have a cancer policy that you could sell 
But guess what? No hospital indemnity and no critical illness. Yes, Tara, how can I help you? This is just an example in my own family. I have a cousin who had a baby accidentally late in life. Um, she will be a senior before he is no longer a dependent. You're telling me that she will not be able to add him to a policy such as this because of her age, even though he's still a dependent child. No, I'm saying that you cannot add a child onto a senior policy. What you would do in the case of that scenario is you would open up a senior combo policy and she doesn't have to get any insurance and you would give a head start for the child and list them there. Senior combo policy? No, no, no. This no, is the super combo. combo. Right, because okay. you're not going to give her any insurance on this form. You're only going to insure the child. If you wanted right. to her, then it would be over here. But there's no children that are allowed on this one. Okay, so two separate policies. Got it. Yep, that's exactly how you would do it. Uh, Joanne, how can I help you? What does the optional recuperation rider do again? So what that means is if you're injured in an accident rather than having to stay in the hospital overnight if you have that rider selected we will That's still you can leave the money okay. every single yep and the way that you get that paid out is you have to have a doctor statement and there's a form for it uh that indicates that you can't return back to whatever maybe you have physical therapy mm -hmm. or something like that. Okay. okay like you were describing okay perfect thank you exactly so you can do the accident the a71 right here or you can do cancer but you cannot do the hospital indemnity and the critical illness. And the reason for that is you're at the age where you're typically going to have hospital visits and you may have a critical illness. Okay. But we will sell you the cancer policy. Then have I received an outline of coverage for the A71 or cancer? Very similar to this one, except obviously no H34 and no CI for critical illness. Does this propose have a medical uh, Medicaid eligibility card? Same thing as 16 and 65 or older. Same thing as 17 over here, right? total amount that's going to be paid, everything looks the same. So the biggest difference is on page two. If I come to page two and I look at page two for this one, there's only nine questions over here, whereas over here there's 18 through 35. So here's the interesting part about the senior, okay? You are only going to ask the questions that are here. You are not going to ask any additional questions whatsoever. Over here, based on what their answer is, we may end up with another form that we then have to fill out that asks a bunch of other questions, correct? Right? But on the senior combo, what did I say happened if you answer yes to any of these questions other than a smoking question? What happens? Anybody? Auto denial? Trial? It goes to trial? Automatic decline. Oh. Oh. Automatic decline if you're a senior answer yes to any of these questions unless it's a smoking question. Okay? Automatic decline. And that's in your student or in your uh, AL International New Agent packet. Okay? Remember page 42 or something like that? It's in there. It tells you that. So you're only going to ask the questions that are here. No additional questions. They don't, and you can even tell the client, hey, I'm going to ask you these questions. I will not ask any additional questions. All I want you to tell me is yes or no. That's it. There is one more thing you have to do that's completely different on this form versus a super combo. In the super combo, I ask on you know, question 28B, have you had any medical treatment in the last five years, including prescription medication? I then, based on whatever medications they give me, I have to put all of that in the medical information form. And depending on the type of medication, I then have to fill out maybe a depression questionnaire or some other type of questionnaire based on a particular condition, right? In the senior combo, I only, down here, if you remember, we talked about this yesterday, I'm going to list every medication that has been prescribed to them. I do not want you to list frequency or dosage. 
I only want the name of the medication and T dozier. If they're not taking any medication whatsoever, what do I type in the remarks or instructions? That All medications. I type what? You would write no medications are being taken, yeah. basically. No medications being taken. Okay, so it, it's an affirmative response. I have to give something to underwriting. Either I give them the name of every single prescription that they have, or I say specifically, they're not taking any medications. So that's the thing that you're going to ask in this form from the client. You're going to say, hey, have you been rejected for life insurance by AIL? Have you used tobacco in the last, past 12 months? Have you been advised that they have a terminal illness, heart, lung disease, cirrhosis, Alzheimer's, all of that stuff, four, five, six, and then if seven and eight and nine are appropriate for your state, they'll come up as well. The only thing that matters is, uh, has the insured used tobacco in the past 12 months? Because if the answer is yes, and they have what, our condition or something like that, then it's going to be an issue you got to submit as a trial, right? The only other thing you're going to ask is what are the prescription medications that you have? And they're going to give you one, 10, who knows? So Samuel, since your hand is raised, I'm going to ask you a question first before you ask me. The question is, every prescription medication they gave me, what do I do with it? You have to look up it on the risk charts, right? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. You need to go and check to see if that medication shows up on page, what is it? There's so many pages, I do this so many times. Okay, you need to look that up on page, there it is right there, 44, Let me make that a little bigger, right? To see if the medications show up here and you gotta submit it as a trial, right? And then for seniors, those right there. Yeah. So if they tell you, hey, I'm on uh, Proloxin, that's on this list, you now know you need to submit it as a trial, okay? Now, what's your question? So if we don't put in that they're not taking medication, is it gonna pop up as an error if nothing is in that field? No, it will not pop up as an error when you do a validation. But your QA people will give you a hard time saying you should have put that in there, so make sure you do that, okay? Yes, Sade, how can I help you? Um, under the medical records ID, is, did you say that we're also putting their social there as well? Yeah, that's what I typically do. It's an easy practice. That way you don't have to come up with a different number. So if they're going to give me their social security number, I just automatically put it over here, right? Right gotcha. there. Okay. To make life easier for me. So on this one here on the super combo, uh, I was 547 something, right? So if I come here and if I type 547, it'll tell me. It'll give me choices because it kind of pre-populates. So I just pick one for him, or not pick one, but I pick the correct one for him and the correct one for her so that it shows up. Same thing over here. And then city is not best time to call and that it gets mailed to the agency. So now you know the difference between a super combo and a senior combo. The biggest thing is do not ask for any more medical information than what's asked here. Make sure that you get listed down here, every single prescription that they're on, and then check your senior uh, auto trial to see if any of the medication they gave you, you need to submit as a trial, okay? Yes, Tara, how can I help you? Okay, this is kind of a best practices question. Um, as we're going through, if there's something that we know we're gonna have to reuse, like their social or their phone number or something like that, is it okay to keep notes as you're going through everything? Yeah, if you want to, absolutely. When I used to do this, I would write down all the notes. Uh, yeah, you can definitely do that because you're the agent. You're the one with the license. It's okay for you to have all that information, right? You exactly. have the license to do that. Okay. Now, the other question I have is this is just kind of a, it's just kind of something that I thought of doing. Is it okay to or do you think it's okay to print all these things out that we have to refer to all the time and maybe put them in a binder with flags? That way we can get to them quickly without having to scramble on the computer when we've already got three or four windows open and we can't find room for it. Absolutely. 
because half of the stuff that you're talking about, I wouldn't want the client to see anyway. Right. So I just carry a binder around. Yeah, it just for me, I've got one, two, three, four, five screens. So I have stuff up that the client will never see because I'm only sharing one screen. Right? I've only got two, so I don't have a whole lot of room for that. <laughs> so just print it out and have it ready for you to go, like the height and weight chart, uh, the drugs, uh, and the automatic trial list. I'd have that stuff. Easy okay. reference, however you want to do it. Awesome. Kelly McDaniel, how can I help you? Yeah, so if you find out I was looking at this and I was just thinking in my head, using my husband as an example, he's had a heart attack. Now, that would be sent back. That would be automatically declined, correct? I, I don't know any more information, so I don't know the answer to your question. He's 65 years old. That would okay. be automatic it's, decline so for him. Well, I don't know. Are you telling me that you're going to auto decline him or are you asking me? I'm asking because it says in the past two years. All right. So let's look at this. We go here. We go here. Has the proposed use tobacco and where's it at? Have you been advised heart lung? No. Nope. Nope. Uh, Question about a number heart five. Attack. Number five. Nope. Has you been hospitalized for a heart attack or stroke? Did he get hospitalized? Yes. Andy has three stints. Okay. So in the past two years, he had a heart attack. So what I would tell him in that particular case, is I would say, hey, at this time, it's too soon from the last time he had a heart attack. We need to wait until we're past two years. Past so two whatever years. time period that is, I'm going to give you a call back. We'll write the policy then. Okay. And my second question, when you get a trial, we don't take any money from them at that point, correct? That's correct. Okay. Bridget Corgill, how can I help you? Sorry to bug you so much, Sam. Um, hey, whoa, whoa. That's exactly why I'm here. <laughs> um, right, how come this one you would send to the agency and the other one you send to the policyholder, or were they both sent no, to the policyholder? It never goes to the agency. Okay, you said agency. You said agency. Said agency. Used. <laughs> oh, well then, yes, I was wrong. You never go to the agency. It always goes to the policy owner. Okay. okay, thank you. You're never going out to visit these folks anymore. So you're not delivering them their policies. Okay, so in this case, we've gone through this. We now know the exact difference between a super combo and a senior life combo. I didn't fill any of this out, so I'm going to go ahead and kill this. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to get rid of the senior life combo. I'm going to remove it so that I'm left with this, okay? I've done validation through all of this, and so now I know I believe everything on here is correct. I think I'm ready to go. Yes, Joanne, how can I help you? So in this super um, combo in the remarks, we do not write the medication as we would with the senior combo? That's correct, because okay. you would write all the medication, including frequency and dosage, in the medical information form. Remember right here? Okay, yeah. I didn't do it, but this is normally where you would fill all that out. And, you would and the seniors the is different. Yeah, and okay. the seniors, I do not need to know why you're taking it, how much you're taking it, or how often. And the okay. reason that is we've already, as underwriting, we've already determined the risk profile for somebody over the age of 60. So all we then Got care it. about is what are you actually taking? And we want okay. to make sure that what you prescribe matches what the MIB tells us or any of the other sources of information that we have. Okay? Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. So now we're here. Whew. I think I'm close to being done. Really? Am I close? I don't know. What would go in the remarks section for the super combo? So in the super combo, you have remarks on page two here. Typically, what I would put in here are going to be things like uh, on page one, if the beneficiary was going to be Mark, but let's say they got three children and all three children are going to receive uh, the benefit payout equally, then I might type that in the remarks section on page two. All three children to receive the payout equally, right? That's that's where you would put additional remarks, usually about their beneficiaries. Everything else is going to fall under a form that you've done, okay? So now I think I'm almost done. I'm almost there. I've got all this stuff. I've looked at everything. I've got little check marks. Or I'm sorry, little glasses everywhere. So I think I'm good. So I'm going to exit out of this thing, and I'm going to pay attention to this one. Now, at this point, Again, how we do from here forward doesn't matter if it's a super combo or if it's a senior, okay? Whew. 
deep breaths, got 22 forms, I'm ready to go. I'm gonna click next. And when I click next, the system is so helpful. It's gonna go through and it's gonna look at everything for me. And it's gonna tell me, mm, did I do some things right? Do I have some issues? It's not the same thing as validating because validating is just looking to see if you have fields populated within each form. This is gonna tell you if you're ready to actually send it to the client for signature. So it's gonna go through, it's doing all 22 forms. It's going to come back and tell me that, uh-oh, I got some issues. So on the medical information form, I didn't fill in all the information. So you can see where you have a red X, that has to be filled out. So I'm not gonna go back and remember what the heck I wrote, but you will. So I'm just gonna fill this in with bogus stuff, okay? So I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to say 01 of 2022, and I'm going to say nope to the hospital. So I'm going to close that, and I'm good to go. Nothing else showed up, so am I okay? I'm going to click next again. It's going to go through the same process to see if, in fact, anything comes up as an issue, just like I had before. Oh, tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. All right, it's going to go through. It's going to take a while. It's just clicking, going through, doing all its work. When you get this screen, that means you're okay with everything that was in here that you put in. When this screen pops up, by submitting the form above, you agree to receive periodic automated text message communication from American Income Life Insurance Company concerning your application for insurance, so on and so forth. We instituted this because we're going to send text messages to the cell phone number that you put as the very first number for the phone number, okay? If you get, if you're a client and you get this and you don't want to receive it anymore, you can type and send back to us, stop, quit, or unsubscribe. So we're gonna click okay. I'm now getting closer and closer. Now I get this screen, this is the sale mode. It's either in-person, virtual with Zoom, or virtual with DocuSign. 100% of the time, you're going to have this say virtual with DocuSign. Okay, there are two email addresses that are required because there are two people on this application, the spouse and the owner or otherwise known as the insured, okay? They each have an email address. Now, when I have a husband and wife, I will put the same email address in for both of them if they're together. And the reason I do that is I don't want anybody to have an email address that's weird, whatever, and cause any problems. So I want to give it to one person only. Now, if they're not in the same place, then yeah, I need a different email address so she can get to it and he can get to it and they both sign, okay? The first person who signs is not the owner. With me? So in the husband and wife scenario, the husband is the owner that I said, correct? That means the wife is going to get the first email from DocuSign, all right? So I'm gonna say john at gmail.com is my email address. And then it's gonna ask me to enter it one more time, just like it did with the bank routing number and the account numbers, because this has always been an issue, is incorrectly entered email addresses. So I enter it again, if I click okay and it matches, it'll just move to the next one. If it doesn't, it'll tell me it's incorrect. Now for Mary, I'm just gonna do the same email address again, because I like to be consistent. And it's just easier to deal with one email address problem than multiple email addresses. So if I click OK and it goes like this, that means the emails were entered correctly both times. All right. So now I'm all set and ready to go, right? Whew, very close. I'm going to click Submit and it's now going to do what? It's going to check and it's going to make sure that the email addresses are validated both. And it's going to come back and it's going to look through every single one of the forms. And it's going to tell me, uh, it's going to come back. I'm sorry, I'm getting text. It's going to come back and it, after it finishes, it's going to tell me what? It's going to tell me what? That I actually need to sign. And every place I need to sign, it has a little uh, glasses telling me I need to open it and sign it. Okay, until I open every single one and sign it, I actually can't click next. Because if I try to click next, it's going to tell me that all, all the forms are signed. 
please sign the unsigned forms. Okay. So I'm going to open up the super combo because that's the one that I have. In the super combo, the place that I actually apply my signature is always going to be on page two right here. You see there's two X's. That means there's errors. And down here it says signature required from the agent. I'm going to click on the first X and I'm going to type in my name, Samuel J. Sweet. Now when I click this because I'm in the training mode, it's going to tell me that my signature does not match the application because the application doesn't come up with my name. It comes up with bogus, right? But when I actually have my agent uh, number, it will match to my name. So don't worry if it comes up like this the first time. So I'm going to go and say, yes, I wish to proceed. And look what happens right here. When I do that, it will append my signature and cursive writing. It will give me the date and it will give me the time. Now, you know what else that it does that you don't see? It provides a geolocation because we're going to use DocuSign to execute these. DocuSign grabs your geolocation, otherwise known as what? Your IP address. Joe Nava, why is your IP address or your geolocation important when we're signing documents? I'm sorry, did he say not sure? Okay, so it's important because I, let's say the client tells me, hey, Sam, uh, I'm having a problem accessing my emails. Can you just sign my name? And Sam, being a very helpful guy, I'm just going to go ahead and sign the name on behalf of Joe Nava, and everything's good to go, right? What have I just done? Anybody? Fraud. Forgery. Well, probably fraud. I wouldn't necessarily say it's forgery, but it's fraud, right? Theoretically. But if the client said it was okay, then it should be okay, right? So how does American Income know that you signed a document? Well, they know because they grabbed the geolocation of through DocuSign of the signature. So if I sign this on behalf of Joe and Joe ever comes back and says, hey, I never signed that document. You guys pulled money on my account. What happened? Oh, I have an executed document right here that you signed. I never signed that. American Income Life will check with DocuSign, get the geolocation and realize that the same IP address signed for both of those signatures. And now they got me, right? So yeah, never do that. Never sign on behalf of a client, ever, ever, ever. If they don't have an email address, you can create an email address for them, like a Gmail. You can create a quick Gmail address and say, hey, here's your Gmail, go ahead and log in. Password is ABC, and you need to sign this. I cannot sign on your behalf. Yes, Samuel, how can I help you? I was going to say it probably it tags their location too, right? No, it tags every time you sign a document, it, it includes the geolocation data. Okay. All right, so now we've done the first one. We're going to go ahead and do the second one. When I do any other signature, it will say, do you want to apply the signature you already did once? Yes, I do. Now I know that I've signed both. I'm done. If I want to check to make sure, I can just click on validate, and it comes back and tells me there's no errors, and it cleared it, the errors down here. Sign twice, I'm good to go. Whew. So I got that one done. It will always tell you when the new draft will uh, be pulled out of the account. All right. So now I have check marks here. I don't need to open those, but the alcohol exclusion, I do need to open that. So I'm going to double click on all of these and I'm going to sign where it says I need to sign. And each time I sign, then it changes those check marks. All right. So I'm signing all this stuff, all these forms that I filled out on behalf of the client, I need to sign as well as the client. Does the app automatically send them DocuSign or do we need to have that up? No, it's all done automatically. You do not have to do anything once you uh, finish at this. Well, once I show you where you finish, everything else is handled automatically. All right. So now I'm signing all of this stuff on the A7-1. It's on page two. You know, here at the bottom, indicating that I've given them the information. And replacement. Remember, I do not have it. So basically we're saying I've used only company approved sales material during the sale. Any sales material used have been left with the applicant. That's uh, referring to HP Pro, okay? So if you use HP Pro, which you're supposed to use 100% of the time for both of these markets, you are completely fine. So I'll double click on this one. The one was for him and now this one is for her. 
close this. Am I getting closer? Uh, accelerated death benefits. So I need to sign this one right here. And remember that the number of forms that show up are going to be pursuant to the number of questions that you actually answered in the affirmative on page two of the application. If you have all answers of no, then you're going to have very few forms that you have to look at, populate, and then sign. All right, so now I have check marks everywhere, right? We can all attest to that. I think, all right, I'm so close, I'm going to click next. And then it's going to check to make sure that I, in fact, actually signed everything. Whew. I'm now to the promised land. Remember, we talked about submitting things as a trial versus submitting things as standard. This is the screen that you make all that magic happen. Yes, Tara, how can I help you? Sorry, mine popped up. There's a, a form at the bottom that says accident outline of coverage triple. And then it's AG 1635TX triple. When I open that, there's the recuperation benefit writer on there. I don't see anywhere on it for me to sign. Is it on page two that you signed it? I looked at page two, there's nowhere for me to sign. It just says it's a reminder. You must leave a copy of this form with the applicant. Okay, so are you at the point that you're signing things? Yes, I've gotten through all my signatures. So just X out of that and see if you can continue to move forward. Okay, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, so here we are at this point and we're gonna submit standard or if we click here i can submit at trial with no money right now the total premium is 146 dollars and 28 cents we know that's going to be for the first time every month after that it would be five dollars less because the five dollar uh, processing fee for the a71 so it would be 141.28 okay when i'm here if i decide that i need to submit mary because she's taking prozac or whatever a lot of it remember or Zoloft, I think. Uh, I want to submit her as a trial. I would click on this and say trial without money. When I do that, you'll see that these numbers change right here. So I'm saying now the total premium is 146, which is still the same, but I'm trialing $58.30 of that. So I'm only going to withdraw 87.98. Does that make sense to everybody? Well, here's a gotcha. If you trial anything here, the entire application will be trialed. So if you're talking to somebody through HP Pro in the presentation and you know, based on what they've told you, that one of the uh, spouses are going to be trialed, but the other one is not, you need to separate into two different applications. So let's say you had a husband and a wife, they're both under the age of 60, one of them is going to be trialed, the other one's not. So let's say the wife is not going to be trialed, but the husband is, based on whatever medication he's taking, height and weight, whatever the case may be. You're going to do the first application and everything that I've shown you on the wife, you're going to put the A71 on the wife, you will list the husband on that application, but you're not going to give him any whole life. You're going to run all that through. You're going to get to this point. When you're done with the entire application for the wife and the A71, then you're going to build a completely separate application from scratch for the husband. This way, the husband will be trialed and you won't get paid on it, which is okay. But the, but the wife, who's not going to be trialed, you will get paid on it immediately. Does that make sense to everybody? Again, if you trial anybody at this point, the entire application will be trialed. Yes, Bridget, how can I help you? So um, does um, the number that 146, does that change if you do it annually or are we doing this just monthly for everybody? You should do monthly for everybody unless somebody tells you they want to do quarterly or annually. And if you did that, then this number would reflect the total premium we're going to take out. So if it's okay. annual... The 141 times 11 plus 146.28, right? The first month with the additional $5 and then 11 months without the $5. Okay. okay. Sade, how can I help you? So I don't understand the number change. Like, are 
are we taking money from them, even if it is a so trial? Like in this case, if I'm submitting everything as standard, then 146.28 is the money we're going to take out of their bank account within the first 48 hours. If I said I wanted Mary to be trialed, what this theoretically would do is say, okay, we're not going to take out the 5830 for Mary. See that ties the 5830 there because mm -hmm. she's trialed. So the total amount theoretically we would take out is only 8798. But the reality is, if you have one application and you're going to trial anybody on that application, we will trial the entire thing, which basically means we're not going to pay you out until the trial is complete. So in order to make sure you get paid what you should get paid in a timely basis, meaning you should get your advance, then you separate husband and wife into two completely separate applications so you get paid out on one and the other one will go to a trial. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you were to hit trial for all three of those, that number at the bottom would say zero? Yep, well, let's do it right now. Trial, okay. and trial, zero. Gotcha, okay. So again, if I'm gonna trial anybody, I'm gonna make that on a completely separate application. Okay. I yes, Zuri, how can I help you? Hey, if you have to break out at this point and do like two separate applications, can is there a way that you can duplicate the information uh, that you've already entered so you don't have to go through and re-enter everything? No. Okay. okay. You'll, have, well, so you'll, you'll know all that information already. But like say you get like uh, a majority of the percentage of the way through like your medical questions and stuff. And you know at that point that, oh, I'm going to have to do a separate application. Like just all that progress that you put in there. Is there any way to save any of that? Like, oh, questions? No, when you open up a new application, it's starting from scratch. It's not going to pull anything from a previous one because it has no idea, right? The computer system has no idea that the previous application has information that you need, right? Okay. So again, it only takes five minutes. It's me. If I know that I now need to bifurcate or cut somebody out of the application, in this case, it's going to be the wife. Any information I took for the wife, I'm just going to write it down real quick on a piece of paper. Because okay. remember, it only takes five or 10 minutes to do this entire thing. Yes, it's taken us four to five hours to get through it today. <laughs> but when you do it live, like when Troy did it, it didn't take that long to get through. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rona, did you have a question or are you good? Uh, yeah, it was basically similar to uh, what Zuri was asking. Uh, yeah. So like basically figuring out that one of the uh, people might go to a trial during EAP, you just kind of have to backtrack at that point and start from uh, start a new. Well, app. you're going to you're going if in this case, if I determine that Mary needs to go to a trial. OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit back and I'm going to go back to the application and I'm going to remove Mary from any whole life and I'm going to leave John intact. And move and keep the A71 on that. So keep in mind, the A71 will only cover whoever's listed on the application. So it's not like a blanket family and anybody who's part of that family will get covered. It's whoever's listed on the application. So the wife and the kids. So you would still keep Mary's name on the application. You would just remove any whole life coverage that you have on her. So that way the application will not be. Okay. Is that is that answer your question, Ronak? Uh, yeah, yep, yep. Sandra Taylor, how can I help you? Just regarding your comment that you would write Mary's information that you've already obtained down, um, wouldn't we be able to pull up both applications side by side and just copy the information we've already entered and paste it into the new application? No, you can't because you're going to get all the way through this and you're actually going to finish it with John. You want that one done completely so you know it went through, and then you're going to start all over again with Mary. That being the case, you can't bring up any of John's information from that application. I mean, that's not really fair. There's things you could do, but in the terms of this class, I don't want you doing any of that stuff yet, right? Just think in your mind that if you have somebody that you know has to be trialed, just write down whatever the medical information that you had on her so that you can add it to the new application. Yes, Zuri, how can I help you? Yeah, um, kind of going back to what you're saying, just when you have to write Mary's policy separately, 
-hmm. because the um everything is tied to the primary like listed applicant you would not check any of the insurance options it would just be mary alone on the island you don't check anything at the bottom of that first page and you just jump into the medical section i'm just trying to like get like a play-by-play -play of like what that looks like no so what you're you're talking okay for for this one if i determine mm -hmm. that mary is going to be trialed i'm going to go back to the super combo and i'm going to take off any whole life coverage that i had on mary mm -hmm. so i'm not putting anything on there and then i'm going to finish up with john and the a71 so mary's name's still on there so she'll have coverage on the a71 but she won't have any whole life and i'm going to finish that application all the way through till it's done then I'm going to start a new application, this time only for Mary, and I'm going to walk through everything that I did with John. I'm going to do it for Mary by herself. All that information will go in there. Okay. So it'll be whole life, but not the A7-100. That's right, because you already okay. have her under the A7-1 under John. Okay, could, sorry, I heard something that threw me. So you clarified it, thank you. You could do that, but you wouldn't want, I mean, all it's going to do is charge her more money and get the same coverage. Right. So you already have her covered on the A71 under John's application. Okay. Sorry so if I'm confusing one initially. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So now we're here. Let's assume that everything was fine. We're good to go. We know we're going to pull out $146.28. And then every month after that, it's going to be $141.28 because the A71 processing fee of $5. So trial without money. Nope. It's all going to be standard. Right. Boom, make sure it also standard. Everything's good to go. I'm going to click next. I'm so close. I'm so close. All right. Now this little screen comes up. Holy mackerel. What is going on here? This is a checklist that you have to fill out. Now, when I did this on my other screen that I'm now pulling over here, this screen comes up, which is your summary sheet. All I want you to do is close this because you already know what you sold and we are actually going to provide a summary sheet to the client okay so you could show this to the client if you want it's something, there's nothing wrong with it but we don't print it out they're going to get it but it's not something you print out i want you to provide a summary sheet that we're going to fill out together that goes to the client okay so all i'm going to do is x this thing out when i x this out the next thing is going to pop up it takes a second but it will pop up and if you're using a laptop it will show up on your laptop if you're using multiple screens it usually shows up on your secondary screen so that comes over here now that is the cash value and the paid up insurance do i want the client to see this probably well it, it, my opinion is no you've already talked about cash value you don't need to go through and calculate everything for them because anything that you start showing now can do what can cause an objection so they can see that it's not the end of the world but you best be able to explain it if you decide to show it to them so after three years there's only 90 dollars. after 20 years it's worth 5500 paid up insurance 17 you know what i mean so i typically do not go through this because it shows up on a secondary screen but if it does pop up and they do see it you have to be able to explain it okay so we do this so I close that one. When I close that one, this comes up and it says, as you saw a need for benefits or any people you know you likewise benefit your program. You don't have to worry about this because what? We've already done this in HB Pro, correct? We already went through all of that. Tara, your office phone number is empty. Yeah, I told you in the beginning that you wouldn't have an office phone number. You need to put your office in there. And it's going to be like, for me, it's Corona. I don't know what RGA ship you're under, but it's whatever that office number is. Okay, so here you're going to just click on continue, and then it's going to come up with a form that you can then add all those people in. You're just going to close this, exit out because you've already got all this information. The next thing that's going to come up is this form, which, yeah, this is important. So, hey, John and Mary, reviewing your application, I'll do everything I can to get these policies issued during the underwriting process. Several things may happen. First, you're going to receive a phone call or more than one, asking you to review the questions that I went through with you. It's like a survey when you purchase a new car, it should only take three to five minutes. This, for all of you as new hires, will definitely happen 100% of the time, okay? 
And there's people that we hire at the RGA level that their whole job is every single day. When you write a policy, they're going to pick up the phone, they're going to call, and they're going to ask. And they usually ask, hey, how were you treated by the agent? Are you taking any medication? Have you been hospitalized five years? If you're on the age of 60, if you're over the age of 60 in the last two years. And do you smoke? Okay. They may ask for a nurse to come out and ask you medical information, uh, sorry, medical questions, and uh, obtain a blood or urine sample. It's at no cost to you, Mr. or Mrs. Client, and it's at your convenience. So we may be requesting medical records from your doctor. You already signed your life away as an applicant, indicating that we can get that. Now we're letting you know that we may do that. In certain circumstances, we may or we may not. In other circumstances, we definitely will, right? If I'm buying $150,000 of life insurance, yeah, they're going to probably have me do a physical, right? Because my risk uh, profile is very, very high for the insurance company. I need to explain to you three possibilities. This is really important right here. And we want to make sure that we let them know this. And we may have told them this uh, at some point during the presentation. It's not in the script, but you may have talked about it, whatever you feel comfortable with. But at some point, you got to tell them, hey, everything can go as according to plan and everything's fine. Or you might be rated, which means your risk classification is higher than somebody of your age and background, or you might be declined. During the underwriting process, we'll do everything possible to get the policies issued. If you may qualify, you actually have to qualify for our programs, right? So we let them know that. And then we say in six to eight weeks, this is, you know, what I say is in six to eight weeks, we're going to send out your policy, right? And this is all down here. I don't go through. You can if you wish, but I do not go through this. Now, what you could also do is you can click on the video at the end of the presentation, which is the closing video, which goes through the same information on HP Pro. And you guys have probably, I don't know if you've seen the video, but you can see where you can click on it. So once I go through uh, one, two, three, four, and five, then I just click continue. And now career opportunity with AIL, this is the only video that's required to be played. But when I click this. At AIL, giving back is our core philosophy. From the that home video office comes staff up, to our field representative. And I immediately just get rid of it. Doesn't do me any value. Because if I'm going to recruit somebody, I don't need to go through a recruiting video. I have a whole different method that I'm going to use and send them to and the overview and all the rest of that, right? And again, I'm a big believer that once you sold something, you never say more than you have to because you don't want the deal to die on you. No point in showing, in my opinion, no point in showing a recruiting video. Now, if you have no experience whatsoever and you're in the home, then a recruiting video might be of, of use. But you can show the website. You can show all kinds of stuff to recruit somebody if they're interested in working with us. Now the recruiting referral comes up. Yeah, just click out of this. You don't want to enter that information here because if you do have somebody who's a client that wants to be a potential recruit, you work with your upline about how they get them in the system. Then the very last thing here is, hey, please donate a non-perishable food item because in the day we thought that was a good idea to get a can of soup or whatever. And then we donate it. Obviously, we can't do that now because we're on Zoom. Am I almost done? I'm so close. Now that I've gone through all that checklist, now I can click all these different areas. Okay. And what's interesting is I got to make that a little bigger so I can get that check mark. You notice down here it says next. It's not highlighted until every check mark has been clicked here. So if you've gone through the stuff I just showed you, then all of these are going to be done. Okay. So I just let the client know I just need to check mark this and then I'm going to click next. And I'm only there. Am I close? Progress locking and packaging the forms for obtaining electronic customer signature. Please wait. I am so close. It's taken us four hours and 20 minutes to get through a 10 minute process. But it's good. We're very, very close. So it's going through, it's basically packaging everything up using DocuSign to do this. Okay. Once it's finished, packaging, it tells you the application package is ready to be sent for signing. It has not been sent yet. It is ready to be sent. The moment I click finish, it will be sent to the client's email. And remember, if it's a husband and wife, the first one that gets sent is an email to the person who's not the owner of the policy. Once that person signs it and fills it out and executes it, then and only then will the owner receive their version for themselves. Okay, so I'm going to click next. And once I click next, 
it will do a little thing that says the application package was sent successfully for signing. I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to click Finish. And now it's gone. I don't see it anymore. It is hopefully on its merry way to the client. When I click on File and go to the Application Wizard, it will tell me the status. So if I remember as John Doe on 118, it is now waiting for signature. What that tells you is that it has not been executed yet. Okay, It means that it's been put into DocuSign. There's an email that came from American Income Life. And in that email, it says, hey, you can go ahead and sign this document, yada, yada. It has a link that goes to the DocuSign website that they click on, and then they can start to sign the document. Everybody tracking with me so far? Anybody have a question about where we're at in the process? No. Oh, that's so awesome. You guys are the, oh, no, now there's questions. <laughs> Kelly McDaniel, how can I help you? So are we still on the phone with them while we wait for their signatures? No, you're not on the phone. You're on Zoom. We're on Zoom. That, that's what I meant. Yes, Are we still on, on Zoom waiting for absolutely, it? Absolutely, because you're not going to okay. let them go until you know they've signed the document. Why? Because you want to get paid. paid. Exactly. So, uh, Michael Carlton, how can I help you? I was just wondering, um, um, why is it that you sent it to the um, the spouse or the non-policy um, um, owner first? Why, is, why do you get their signature first? Because a policy owner is the last person to sign it, indicating they're going to pay money. You need to send it to the other insured so that they know that somebody's actually taking out insurance on their life. Okay. Okay. All right. So now we're here. And then DocuSign comes. So now somebody's going to get this email. When they get this email, here are the instructions that I have that I walk them through. I'm going to say, hey, Sandra Taylor, here's what you're going to do. You're going to open up that email. You're going to click on that link. When you click on review document, it's going to pop up with an I agree box, basically saying, hey, you're going to sign this electronically. You're going to say, yes, I agree, and click continue. Then you're going to click the sign button, and then you're going to hit every yellow box with the down arrow, and then you can either sign with your finger or click select styles. You sign with your finger if you're using your phone, because DocuSign knows if you're using your phone, you can sign with your finger, and if you're using your computer, it will ask you what style you want to use to sign, and then you're going to adopt and sign. Every single time after that, it will take the signature that you used and it will apply it. When you completely finish the entire DocuSign signature process, there's a little yellow box at the end that says, click finish. When you click finish, it will say, hey, do you want to uh, save this document and create a account? That's an account on DocuSign, not an account with American Income Life, okay? We say, no, you don't need to do that because most people don't use DocuSign very often particularly the people we're selling to. Most people have used it, but they're just not going to use it enough that they need their own account. Now, when you do that and they click finish, they'll get an email that comes back from American Income that says, hey, you successfully signed your document. If they're the spouse and they sign first, then and only then will American Income send the second person or the policy owner the actual final signatures. Okay, so then they get their final signature email, they open it up, and they go through all of the same thing as you got. Now you're still on Zoom, you're walking them through it, you're helping them, and you're asking them, hey, did you click finish? Yes, I did. Did you get an email from American Income saying that you've completed the signature process? And they're hopefully going to say, yes, I did. Then what you do, once you've done that, you're going to click on this right here, File, Submit, Sales, and Sales Status Screen. When you click on that, if they have successfully executed the DocuSign, both parties, or if there's just one, that's fine. But when the owner clicks Submit and signs everything and gets an email back from American Income saying you've completed it, at that point, when you open up the Sales Status Screen, you should see that application right here. It will tell you the name, your agent number, how many forms, the total cash, how long it's been in there, and ready to transmit. 
So you can then click on it. Obviously, I don't have one here because it wasn't real. You click on it, highlight it, and then this button that says upload will now be highlighted. The moment you click that, that application is in the cloud and at the home office. And then you know what? You have successfully submitted an application for somebody to get coverage. Great job. Are you done? Mm, almost. You've done everything to get paid. There is one more thing I want you to do. After you click that, you're telling them, hey, I'm going to send you an email. So here's the million dollar question, Devin. What is attached to the email I'm going to send the client? Devin, trying to get everything working over there. No, no, my girlfriend's cat is on top of my mind. <laughs> about to. Uh, Am I going to send to the client? Um, it should be maybe. I'm gonna take a guess at this. Maybe a. Well, I feel like we've already done a review. On okay. our set, so it wouldn't be a review, would it? Oh, look at you equivocating at your best tap dancing. You need to be confident. What do you think you need to send the client? A PDF file. I mean, Ooh, PDF a file of, what? of what? I guess all the, all the documents. What are the documents? I mean, be there what we just filled out. The super combo contract, the application. No, they already got that. They got that in the DocuSign. So you aren't going to send that. That's done automatically. Okay. What are the three things that we are going to send the client? The burial and will kit. So okay, like absolutely. The burial and will kit. You send that 100% of the time, correct? Right. What else are you going to send the client if you sold to them? The AIL plus card and a family info guide. No. I'm, I'm going with answers in the chat because um, I see that. That's fine. <laughs> you can add that stuff in there, but 100% of the time, you need to send them the PDF file that you downloaded, right? Okay. Either on the veteran market, it's the family information guide. And in the uh, credit union market, it's the, I'm sorry, in the veteran market, it's the family information guide. In the credit union market, it's the financial information guide. Okay. You could send the other stuff too if you wanted to. That's fine. But in the email I'm talking about, when you sell to a client, there are three things that you're always going to provide. Thing number one is the downloaded PDF file from HP Pro, correct? Yes, correct. Thing number two is going to be the AIL summary sheet and the policy service file. So let's open up the AIL summary sheet. When I open up the AIL summary sheet, Hopefully it opens up one of these days. Here you go. This is what opens up. And this was attached. You guys should have this. You're going to put in the applicant's name, the date, how much coverage they got based on what you sold them, and the accidental death, auto death, common carrier, because we have all that information, right, from HP Pro. We're going to put in the hospital benefits, whether or not they got the cancer plan, uh, the organization, the premium, how often they're paying, what they're paying, comes out of the checking account, your name, your agent number, and your phone number. I would like you to do this 100% of the time. And the reason why is because twofold. Number one, it's the only time that you're sending an email from you to them in the beginning, right? Up to then, you've never really had to send an email. I mean, if you use Calendly and stuff like that, maybe. But now you're give, you're definitely going to do this here. So now they have your contact information out of your sick pick, right? Or your signature on your email. You're sending them this. So they know what the heck it was that they bought. Because yes, they have DocuSign, they can jump back in there, but you're gonna tell them in one page exactly what you just sold them and how much they're being charged, okay? And you're putting your name and number in here as well. So it's a nice little, I'll call it a receipt for lack of a better word, but for me, I have all my new agents send this 100% of the time and they copy me. That's the best practice. Why? Because then I know exactly what they believe they sold the client. And I match that against all the reporting that I got for them so I can make sure that they align. If there's a misalignment, I can fix it before the client gets upset. I do that as an SA, GA, MGA, whatever, right? For new agents. 
if you've been around for a while and work for me, I still have you send this out, but then I don't need you to send it to me because I know you know what you're doing, All right? So the PDF file, whether it's the financial information guide, the uh, family information guide, the will kit, if you're in the veteran market, that gets sent plus the summary sheet if you sold something to them. The other thing that you're going to send is the policy information, I'm sorry, the policy service file. Now, this is kind of cool. I like this simply because we used to leave folders that looked exactly like this with clients when we sold them. Now, we're not in their home anymore, but we made a digital representation of that file. So basically, that looks kind of cool. It then says, okay, there's the freedom of choice. Okay, yeah, I did talk about that in HP Pro. I talked about how good that was. If they need to assign it, because in HP Pro, we only show the first side or the first page right? It's an updated version. It looks nicer, but here's the one we've had for many years. The second page or the back of this one actually is where you can assign the amount, right? So now they have that in case they die. Then we talk about what comes next. Same thing we talked about before. We don't need to worry about a voted check because we're not doing that here. Some investigative consumer reports, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have a policy service request. So mostly not mostly, 100% of the time, I want my clients to call me no matter what it is they want to talk about with American Income. Call me. I'm here to help you. Because every single time you call me, I may have an opportunity to get another referral or sell you more coverage or bring your kids in or whatever, right? However, <laughs> if I don't do this and the policy owner doesn't call me, they call customer service, what do you think customer service is going to do with that policy owner? Anybody? Try and sell them. Exactly. They're going to talk about their coverage amounts. They're going to talk about, hey, what else can we do for you? And hey, maybe you want, want to do it. They're going to sell. And if the policy owner is open to it, they're going to buy, right? And so you just lost out on potential sales. So I'm big about every single person you ever sell to, make sure they come back to you. That's your brand. So policy service request, different things in here they can do. They put their policy in here. If it's an address change, name change, beneficiary change. Okay. That happens here. We can do that for them as well. Then we have a claim form. Part A, Part B, attending physician statement. And then we have proof of death, claimant statement. We let them know what they knew do in various states. And then we have a life claim form that they can actually fill out right here. Again, if somebody wants to make a claim, I'm going to help them with that. Okay. But by giving this to them, it gives them all the information they need to do pursuant to getting a payout on the policy that they're paying money for. And then the last page here is uh, bank authorization. We already did all that. So basically, this just lets them know that they have something tangible now. They have the PDF file with all the information that we gave them pursuant to the veteran market or the credit union market. They then have the uh, policy or the summary sheet, the IL summary sheet, which says this is what you did buy. And then they have this uh policy service file that says any additional information, you can take a look at this, but if you have any questions or have any claims, call me. Yes, Dave, how can I help you? Uh, I was just gonna comment, you also want their information in case they um, decide that they want to uh, lower the amount that they have, because if you have, if they call the home office, the home office will just cancel it. No, the home office won't just, no. It, if they, I mean, if the, if the person call, if the person calls and says they want to cancel their policy, right. So what? So first of all, they would call customer service, not necessarily the home office. And AIL, what they'll do is they'll say, okay, they'll send a mod to you to let you know that that potentially could happen, and then they're going to send a bunch of paperwork to the client who actually has to sign with wet signatures and send that back before the policy is canceled. So if somebody were in that mindset that was one of my clients, I'd rather have them contact me first so that I can talk about reducing the cost of their policy, right? In order to keep them as long as possible because I'm already making money off them. Now, if it's past year one, then really all I'm losing is the 5% renewal fee, but any dollar is worth a dollar to me, right? So I'd rather have them call me to prevent that. So yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, Samuel, how can I help you? So if they're going through you with any of their questions, is that more or less going to keep them out of like the POS calls? No. Okay. It will not, it, POS calls will be made regardless. So that's why you need to build your rapport with the client. So if they get a POS call, they'll just come back to us. 
as the agent. So oh, I already have an agent. His name is Sam. I'm going to work with him. So you need to send to the client the AIL summary sheet. You need to send to the client the downloaded PDF file from HP Pro, right? Whatever's included in that. And the last thing you need to send is the policy service file. Those three things are the things that you should send every single time you saw. Now, some uplines do this, some uplines don't. I prefer that you know exactly what I recommend that you do. You decide what you're going to do. The reason I have you do these three is they all matter. They all help you, right? The summary sheet helps because now it's a tangible thing that the client says, okay, this is what I actually bought. I don't need to look at the email on DocuSign and try to figure out what did I get. I try to remember things going on. I got one sheet that tells me. What I do actually is I text that to the client. I just text it right to the client. And boom, they have it on their phone. Here's exactly what you just bought. Oh, okay, cool. Got it. The downloaded PDF file is that which I already told them and am committed to sending to them because that's part of my entire process. And then the policy service file is just to help them and give them more information should they have a claim down the line. Yes, Nick, how can I help you? So the uh, uh, the uh, AIL summary sheet and the policy service file are attachments that you sent over uh, early on. Or where you do I that again? I don't understand what you asked me. Okay, so where do I, where do we find the AIL summary sheet and the policy service file? So it's an attachment to the day one email that I sent you. That, that's what I was asking. Okay, great. Oh, that's there. And then what I do is I open up, let's say, the uh, AIL summer sheet. And then I save this under the name of the people that I sold to. And I keep it all in the same directory. So I typically open it up. I, I label it by date and then by last name and then comma first names. So it would be... Uh, you know, January 18th, 2023. So the way I do it is I go 011823 space uh, sweet space John space Julie, if I were selling in that particular space. That's how I would do it. And then this way, uh, I can always go back and look and say, what the heck did I sell them? What did I tell them I sold them? Does that match with what they actually got if they have any questions later? Yes, Shardy, how can I help you? So the policy service file we're sending them blank yeah okay. okay yeah it's just helpful information it, they don't need to do anything with it if you fill out the uh sorry the uh summary sheet then you're fine you've given them all the information about what you sold yes tara how can i help you uh company wise are we allowed to add a business card to like the page one of the policy service file and keep and send that instead of the standard. The policy service file, you're saying add your business card on page one. I, I, I don't know. Could I insert my business, a business card onto page one right here where all this blank space is? That sure. way, the first thing they see when they open that policy service file is me. Are you talking about right here? Right. Yeah, you could do, you, if you want, if you know how to do it, you can manipulate PDF files, certainly you can do that. Okay. Absolutely, there's nothing that prevents you from getting any information to them that you want to give, okay? Nothing at all. And remember, you're all independent contractors, so you can do what you think is in the best interest as long as it's not violating the terms of your contractual relationship with AIL, nor is it violating the licenses that you receive from your resident states or your non-resident states. Okay, and also on the AIL summary sheet, Mm -hmm. If you'll click back to that. Mm -hmm. Additional benefits. Number one is pre-filled out. Why is that something we can we need to delete, get rid of? No, that's every single policy its whole life that we saw includes a strike waiver and a layoff waiver. Now, ostensibly, that was for the unions because we we're the only union insurance company. And so we included that. But every time we sell any policy, a client if they're laid off, can apply for a waiver of their premium for three months. So you okay. have to submit a request for a waiver for each month. You can do it up to three months. And when we waive it, we actually mean we waive it. You're not required to pay us back. 
So if I got laid off from a job, no matter what type of job I had, and I had a policy, I can request a waiver of those premiums. Yeah, I understood that. I just didn't realize that that was automatic on all our policies. Yeah, it's automatic. I didn't bring it up because that's usually in the, uh, particularly the strike waiver is usually in the union market, but we give it to everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. Absolutely. So there you go. We have now used EAP to successfully submit or actually fill out an application, whether it's a super combo, whether it's the uh, senior combo. We fill out a bunch of additional forms that come up. We told you exactly what you need to do to fill out uh, the senior combo in terms of the medication that somebody takes. We told you on the senior combo that you do not ask for any additional information other than what's asked on the medical information page or the second page, right? We don't volunteer nor do we ask for any additional information other than that. And we list on that senior application down at the bottom, all the prescription drugs that they're currently taking. We do not care about the frequency or the dosage. And then on the super combo, we walk through all the different scenarios if somebody's taken Zoloft or Pro, Prozac or something like that, or anxiety or depression or PTSD, what you need to do to fix those things or fix the answer to the question, was it 24B? And then we talked about the answering yes to everything and that results in digital forms that come up and that you need to populate accordingly. And then so we had all that done, we talked about how you package it all together. And uh, if in fact, you're successful at doing all that, how you submit something as a trial, as opposed to standard. And once all of that is done, we talked about how you walk through DocuSign. And then after that's successfully done, we talked about sending the one email at the end that includes what? The uh, AIL summary sheet, the service uh, file, as well as the downloaded PDF file. There is one last thing that I like to always address on HP Pro, and that is, what if I made a mistake? And the biggest mistake people typically make is that the email is incorrect. So the client never gets the email. They're like, hey, this didn't work. What happened? So I want to show you how you can potentially fix that. So here you're going to go back to application package wizard where everything you put together is here. And so we know it was today, right? So 118. It should be here somewhere, right? 118. So it's right there. Let's say that either I got the age wrong or the email was wrong. Something happened, okay? I need to fix it. And I've done this multiple times where the email address didn't work. Maybe they can't get to it. Not working. A lot of times Google will stop allowing them to view their emails when the uh, storage is full. So they'll tell me, oh, I think it's too full. I need you to send it to another email address, like my wife's or someone else. Like, okay, here's how you do it. You highlight the application and you click on next. When you click on next, it brings you to this screen, which we saw before, very standard, right? The name, agent number, and the state. And we click on next one more time and you'll see everything that's in here for that particular application. If I try to open this, it will in fact open, the difference being everything now is gonna be completely grayed out I can't make any changes uh, to this policy at this point, or I'm sorry, to this application. It's not a policy yet. See how it's all grayed out? Nothing I can do. I can't change anything here, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and close that. And again, I'm back at this screen. And now what I wanna do is unlock it. So I'm gonna click on unlock. It's gonna ask me, okay, you need to put in this code. So D, Y, WBR, that code changes every single time you have to do this, you're going to click on OK. And then it's going to ask you, why are you unlocking this? Well, maybe I had the address incorrect. Something was wrong, right? So I'm going to say email was incorrectly entered. And are you with the applicant? Yeah, you should be. And then once you click OK, what you're going to find is it will now go through and unlock the entire application process so you can then fix whatever issues that you had immediately. So if I want to come in and look at the super combo now, now it's all blue, I can make any changes to this that I want. This invariably happens to new hires, invariably. Because you get an email incorrect, even though you entered in twice, 
clients will tell you, oh, that's not the right email address. Or, you know what? I don't want to go from that checking account. I want it to be in a different checking account. So now you can do that entire process over. It happens. It's okay. And now you know exactly how to unlock an application, even though you've submitted through DocuSign and everything, you know how to unlock it, fix it, go through the process again, and then send it out. So we went through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different facets of EAP. We started at nine o'clock. For all intents and purposes, it's two o'clock with a 15 minute break. With nine, three, that's five hours minus 30 minutes, about four hours and 30 minutes. Now, when you do this, again, I told you five to 10 minutes is all it takes to get through this. The longest part of a entire presentation with a client is going to be HP Pro, and then it's going to be getting them to actually sign it. Literally, this part of the process doesn't take long once you learn how to do this. As a matter of fact, whoever watched Troy yesterday, how long did it take for him to get through this part? Do you know? Anybody know? It wasn't Anybody? very long. He was yeah, quite quick long. at it. Yeah, it's really easy once you get this, you just zoom right through a piece of cake. Okay. So eight different sections. We know the policy service file. We know the summary sheet. We know the downloaded PDF. Everything is good. I am finished and I would upload it to impact or upload it to the home office. If I wanted to hold it, because they're not going to get paid till Friday, I can keep it on my computer and not upload it, which means AIL doesn't know it exists at all. They have no idea it exists. If I'm going to do that, I'm going to tell the client, that means you don't have coverage until I send this to the home office. So I'm going to wait till Friday to do that. And once I send it on Friday, then you're going to have coverage if I'm submitting it as standard. All eight items, all three things you're sending on an email to the client. Do I have any questions? Okay, I have no questions. That's awesome. Here's what's going to happen now. I am going to take a 15-minute break. That means I'm going to come back roughly right around and uh, top of the hour a little bit after, okay? You can stick around with me, and I will then walk you through the different scenarios that you have for homework. I will look at anybody's screen and help them figure out how to get things to work correctly. I will do that for the next four hours if you're anybody is still here. For anybody that wants to do that, piece of cake, I'll stick around with you and I will help you. If you don't want to do that, you want to go work with your upline, that's fine too. But the point is, I'm giving you access to me to do anything on HP, I'm sorry, on EAP that you need to do. There is homework. If we look at the uh, new hire, uh, sorry, not new hire, the AO International new agent uh, handout on page, what is it? 25. 20, no, on page 28. 28. Am I still sharing my screen? Yeah. Okay. On page 28, you have four different scenarios, actually two on 28 and one on, two on 29. Ronald, Tina Jones, Calvin and Patricia Flanagan, Kai and Dara Shang, and Magic Johnson. If you're sticking around with me, here's how I want you to do it. I'm going to put you in the different breakout rooms. You're going to work together. I don't care, but each one of you are going to build EAP, and you're going to show me EAP in the breakout room, and I'm going to tell you if you did everything right. If you run into a problem, then you call me, and then I'll come into your breakout room, and I will help you. But the homework for tonight is you have to do all four of these. And what I found is if you stick with me, I end up having you do more, but you become more familiar with it, and then you don't have any issues later. If you don't stick around and try to do the homework, and you run into a problem, then you're stuck. Who are you going to call? Try to call your upline? Sure, you could do that. I don't know if your upline is going to take the time to help you right then. Why? Because they're busy working with everybody else who are actually selling the clients. So I'm a resource that's available to you. I want you to be successful. I want you to feel comfortable with EAP. Keep in mind, HP Pro took a lot of time to teach, and it takes time to present because you got to go through everything. EAP takes a lot of time to teach, but it doesn't take you any time at all once you know how to do it to actually enter in the application information. 
Okay, so I'm going to come back in about 15 minutes. I will then put everybody who wants to stick around into breakout rooms. You'll work together. Call me as you need me. For everybody that does stick around, when you're ready to show me each one of these scenarios, you'll call me into your room and I will tell you exactly what I want to look at. And if you have a problem or an error, I will point it out and then I'll also show you how to fix it. Okay. Yes, Tara, how can I help you? If we decide to go in and do these on our own, how do we submit the homework to you? You need to take screen captures of page one, page two, and a screen capture of all of the forms that show up based on the answers to the questions. And then okay, you, you need to send those to me. You want a screen capture of every form or just the list? No, just the list. Because I can look at that and tell Yeah, I don't care if you filled it out, but I can tell you what you did wrong if I don't see the forms that I'm expecting to see in that list. Okay, great. Are you telling me, Tara, that you're not going to stick around to work with me? I'm Is trying to decide. I think I've got it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Michael Carlton, your hand is raised, but I don't see you. So, oh, there you are. What's up? How can I help you? Um, okay. I haven't been able to get on e app. Uh, you said I had to ask my upline. My upline, yes. when I asked him for his credentials, he was like, uh, we would do it after class or whatnot. But I would rather stick with you, you know what I'm saying, to do them, but I can't because I can't get on e yeah, I'm sorry. So I would, I, I would ask my upline, I mean, if he says do it after class, then you're going to have to do it after class. I can't make him do anything or make them do anything, right? It's entirely up to them. Oh. Well, all right. I guess you answered my question. Well, thank you, Sam. I guess I'll yeah, probably talk tomorrow, I guess. I'm here to help as much as I can. Any well, if any, time, if any time within the four hours uh, I have it downloaded, can I come back in here or what? Yeah, I will still be here for the next four hours. Okay. After I take a break, though, you got to give me 15 minutes to get something to eat. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. All right, that's cool. Fine. Any other questions from anybody? Uh, Tara, I already asked a question. Brittany Shea, how can I help you? So, again, my e app's not working at all. So, what, like, then you all. can't do the homework. That what? I said you can't do the homework if you can't get e app okay. to work at all. That's fair, oh, okay. right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just didn't want to stress over it. I don't know. No, no, why it's not... If you can't get e app to work, but I would say your number one priority is it's, to contact tech support or contact yeah. your upline to get that to work okay 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 thank you yeah, of course absolutely uh any other questions is anybody going to stick around and have me work with them anybody oh i got a couple I'm, of hands i'm sticking around all right awesome so give me 15 minutes so that means 10 minutes after the hour i will be back and i will be more than happy to help anybody that's here after I put your breakout rooms with EAP. Uh, everyone, raise your hands. We're good. All right, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and if you're not sticking around, then I will see all of you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time. <laughs>